Hello and welcome. I'm Judy Burkhardt, National Director of the Nursing Programs for Kaplan, and welcome to this, to this discussion of Physiological Integrity 3, Reduction of Risk Potential. In this um, discussion, we're going to be talking about some disease processes, we're going to be talking about diagnostic tests and what you need to know about them, and also some therapeutic procedures. Let's begin. The first thing we're going to talk about is diabetes mellitus. This is an important topic because it's frequently tested on the NCLEX exam. Let's take a look at the type of questions you may see. First of all, you may see questions that require you to know the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, or low blood sugar, and hyperglycemia, or elevated blood sugar. Also, HHNKS, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. You also need to know the difference between type 1, which is IDDM, or insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, and type 2, which is non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. You need to know the diagnostic test for diabetes, and you need to know about the diabetic food exchanges. Other things you need to know for diabetes. You need to know how to mix insulins when you're mixing regular and NPH insulin. You need to know what they call the sick day rules. If a diabetic is sick, should they take their insulin? Should they decrease their food intake? Exactly what should be done? You need to know about SMBG, which stands for self-monitoring blood glucose, because this is a way that diabetics maintain control and evaluate their blood sugar in the home setting. You need to know about the difference between the different types of insulin and oral hypoglycemics, how each of them work. And you need to know about diabetic food, foot care and why it's important and what should be done. Let's begin with an assessment of diabetes. What clients with diabetes will present with is, and we in nursing school we called it the three P's, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia. Now polyuria is increased urination. Polydipsia is increased um, intake of oral fluids due to thirst, and polyphagia is an increase in appetite. Again, many times diabetics, when they come in and are initially diagnosed, have a weight change, and this is especially true of insulin-dependent diabetics that are children. Let's take a look at the different types of diabetes. First of all, we have type 1. It's known as IDDM. That's insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. This is usually or frequently a young person that has little or no circulating insulin, and they need injections of insulin to sustain life. Type 2 diabetics, on the other hand, or NIDDM, non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, many times it's seen in the adult population. Uh, this person may be overweight, and they many times are treated, or many times they, they are treated with oral hypoglycemics and dietary changes. There is gestational diabetes mellitus, or GDM, and we talked about this when we talked about the different high-risk pregnancies, and their secondary diabetes. This is diabetes that's caused, for example, from a tumor in the pancreas. Let's take a look at the diagnostic test you should be familiar with regarding diabetes. The first diagnostic test is the blood glucose or the fasting blood sugar. It's important for you to know that normal blood sugar is 60 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. The second type of diagnostic test for diabetes is the GTT or glucose tolerance test. In this case, a glucose load is given orally, and then blood sugars are checked or assessed at different time periods. Another type of diagnostic test is the glycosylated hemoglobin, or the HbA1c. This tells you how the person has maintained control over a uh, previous, about a three-month period. Good diabetic control will be a result of 2.5 to 6%. So even if they cheat, and get back in control the day or before they go in, this test will pick up the fact that they have been non-compliant in the past. Let's take a look at the type of things that are done to control diabetes. Well, first of all, there will be dietary changes, and most diabetics use what is known as a diabetic exchange list. This diabetic exchange counts both the type of food the person is eating and the amount of it. The different type of exchanges that are on the diabetic exchange list are bread or starch, vegetables, milk, meat, poultry, eggs, or fish, fruit, fat, and then there are some free exchanges that don't count. Another type of implementation for diabetes is insulin management. It is critically important that you know the different types of insulin. You need to know onset, peak, and duration of the different types, all the way from regular to the long-acting insulins. 
Again, they won't ask you that particularly, but a common question on the exam is, Mr. a patient has taken regular insulin at 7 a.m. At 10 p.m., he's doing such and such. What would the nurse expect to do or what is going on? And you have to identify that the person perhaps is hypoglycemic. Another type of thing that is implemented for diabetes is what they call sick day rules. If a diabetic is sick, what should they do? Well, there's a couple of rules that should be implemented. First of all, the client should take the insulin as ordered. They should evaluate or assess their blood sugar every three to four hours to find out if they are becoming hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic. If they're unable to eat their regular diet, they should eat soft foods about six to eight times per day. And if they have vomiting or diarrhea, they should begin drinking liquids. These would be things such as cola, broths, Gatorades. And again, they would, should drink these every half hour to hour to make sure and maintain their blood sugar. So these are the type of implementations. It's a combination of dietary change, insulin administration, and you know, knowing what to do if they become ill while they're on this regime. Let's take a look at the symptoms of hypoglycemia or insulin reaction. Again, hypoglycemia is when there is too much insulin, the blood sugar has fallen. The client will present with, they will be irritable, they may be confused, they may be experiencing tremors, their vision may become blurred, and their skin will be cool and clammy. Now, one of the easier ways to remember the difference between hypo and hyperglycemia is to form a mental image of what someone would look like if they're hypoglycemic and make them all of the things we just talked about. They're irritable, they're confused, they're shaking, they're cool and clammy when you touch them, and make that mental image. Then on the exam, when they describe a patient to you, you can compare it with what you know to be signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Let's take a look at the treatment that is um, prescribed for insulin reaction or hypoglycemia. They should take oral fluids. Could be orange juice. They should take skim milk. Now, skim milk sometimes is better than orange juice because it's a slower acting carbohydrate and it will not cause the patient to ping pong, go from hypoglycemia up to hyper and back. If the client is unconscious, you know that you will be unable to give them oral fluids. So in this case, you would give them dextrose 50% IV. Again, no, no oral fluids if the client is unconscious. Let's talk about the flip side of the coin, which is hyperglycemia. Symptoms of hyperglycemia or diabetic ketoacidosis you will see is, first of all, the client may complain of a headache. They may become drowsy and weak. Their skin will be warm and dry. They may have a fruity odor to their breath. And they may have what we call Cushmol respirations. These are very deep, rapid respirations. Again, it's very helpful if you form a picture of this person. They're kind of headachy and drowsy. They're weak, but when you touch them, they're warm and dry. They've got this odor to their breath, and they're breathing very rapidly and very deeply. And you can see that this contrasts with the mental image you have of a client with hypoglycemia. Let's take a look at what the treatment is for hyperglycemia or diabetic ketoacidosis. Well, you will give them fluids because, because the sugar is high. Remember, this is dehydrating, so you need to maintain fluid volume. So you will give them 0.45 NaCl or half normal saline or perhaps normal saline, which is 0.9% NaCl would be used. You will administer regular insulin and you will give this IV. Remember, regular insulin is a short-acting insulin. Onset is about half an hour to an hour. Peak two to four lasts six to eight hours. Remember, regular insulin is the only insulin that can be given IV, and it is the only insulin given in an emergency situation. The patient may also be given potassium as soon as the output is satisfactory. Let's talk about symptoms of HHNKS, which is hyperglycemia, hyperosmolar, non-ketotic syndrome. Again, this is a frequently tested topic, so it's important that you know about it. In this situation with HHNKS, the patient will have a very high glucose level. They will be very hyperglycemic. The level will be above 800 milligrams per deciliter. And remember, we said normal was 60, milligram, 60 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. So 800 and above is almost off the charts. 
The type of patients that develop HHNKS are type 2 diabetics. These are the non-insulin dependent diabetics rather than the type 1 that are insulin dependent. Usually the patients that, ha that develop HHNKS are your older adults older than 50 years old. The type of symptoms you'll see, the patient will become hypotensive. They will have very dry mucous membranes and they may experience seizures. The issue here is dehydration and, and volume deficit. So what will we do? Well, knowing that it's volume deficit, we're going to first and foremost restore fluid volume and we're going to use an isotonic fluid to do that, which is 0.9% sodium chloride or normal saline. Again, the patient will be given insulin and it will be regular insulin because it's a fast acting insulin. It will be given IV at about 10 units per hour. You will check the patient's vital signs and again, monitor the blood pressure especially because they go into this exhibiting hypotension. And you'll monitor the glucose levels carefully. And you should see the blood sugar begin to come back down. Okay, let's go on. We're gonna change gears a little bit here. That is our, our short review of diabetes. Again, very important topic for you to be very comfortable with and familiar with for the young clucks. Let's talk about GI infections. Again, something that can occur and is frequently tested. With GI infections, what should you do? And these are things such as salmonella you get from handling chickens without appropriate cooking, that type of thing. Well, first of all, good sanitation. And good sanitation means, you know, good water from good water supply, but it also means washing your hands after using the bathroom. It means washing your hands and washing all your cooking utensils when you are preparing chicken or meat products. Again, the good hand washing is important. Proper food preparation. In addition to washing things in between preparing them, you need to cook food appropriately. You don't eat raw pork. You don't eat raw hamburger because of the danger of E. coli and other issues. And this is especially a problem for children, infants and children, and immunocompromised or elderly that don't have perhaps a real strong immune system. The type of things you want to do if a patient does develop a GI infection is to maintain fluid and electrolytes because diarrhea is a very common um, complication or, or symptom seen with a GI infection. And the type of medications that are given are antibiotics, antispasmodics, and antiemetics. So again, a lot of prevention here. There's a lot of health teaching that should be done with your clients in healthcare settings. Let's talk now about a hiatal hernia. Hiatal, hiatal hernia, again, frequently tested. What do you need to know? The type of questions you will see on the NCLEX frequently concern the symptoms of hiatal hernia, the medications ordered for patients with hiatal hernia, and what type of teaching you should do with these clients. Now let's talk about a hiatal hernia. Remember, this is when part of the stomach comes up into the lower portion of the thorax. Under assessment, what you will see, the patient will complain of a feeling of fullness when they're laying down. They may experience what we call a splashing sound in the substernal region, and they may experience heartburn. And again, remember, the substernal region is below the sternum. Type of implementation they do for hiatal hernia. They give them medications. One of the type of medications are H2 receptor blockers, such as Tagamet and Zantac. They will give the patient anti uh, antiacids, such as milk of magnesia. They will give them the cytoprotective agents, such as caraphate. Other type of things they do is they do surgery. And what they'll do for surgery is they will tighten the cardiac sphincter of the stomach to keep it in place. The patients should be put on small, bland meals after surgery, and they should be taught to sit after eating for an hour. It, once you eat, don't go lay down. Sit up for an hour to allow the stomach to empty before you um, lay down. And they should elevate the head of the bed when they're sleeping. It will help with the problem. Okay, let's talk about pyloric stenosis. Again, frequently tested topic. What type of things do you need to know? Well, first of all, you need to know the symptoms of pyloric stenosis. You need to know the complications that can occur, and you need to know what type of care to do with patients after surgery. Let's take a look at what type of symptoms someone with pyloric stenosis would show. First of all, they will present with projectile vomiting. 
They may have epigastric fullness. They may experience anorexia in weight loss. They may have diminished stool. Now you'll see this especially in infants. In adults, they will present with constipation. There will be a palpable olive-shaped tumor in the epigastric region. And you may be able to observe peristaltic waves. Let's take a look at the type of thing you do for implementation for pyloric stenosis. Well, what you'll do is, preoperatively, you will have the patient on small, frequent feedings. And you'll position them upright after they eat. If the patient is unable to tolerate feedings, you will implement gastric decompression. This is the passing of an NG tube attached to suction to empty the stomach. You want to make sure and correct all fluid and electrolyte imbalances. These patients are especially prone to alkalosis, hypokalemia, which is a low potassium, and dehydration. After surgery for pyloric stenosis, you want to check the incision. If this is an infant, you want to provide support for the parents. This is very frightening to parents to have a child, a very young child that is, that is critically ill. So you want to provide support and make sure they know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how they can help their child. The child will come back from surgery and will have IV fluids going to maintain hydration. They will start the child with small frequent feedings of glucose water or an electrolyte solution during the first four to six hours. If the child maintains that without any vomiting or any um, unusual occurrences, they will start formula at about 24 hours postoperatively. Let's now change a little bit, talk about another topic. Let's talk about gastritis. You remember that gastritis is inflammation of the stomach. The type of assessment you'll see with gastritis is the patient will present with abdominal pain. They may have headache. They may have anorexia and vomiting, and, they, and the vomiting perhaps might be bloody, and they may be hiccuping. Under implementation for gastritis, they will make the patient NPO for a period of time and then gradually progress to a bland diet. They may order antacids, and if the gastritis is due to alcohol abuse, they will do a referral for treatment. Let's talk about ulcers. Again, ulcers are a frequently tested topic. The type of questions concerning ulcers usually involve the symptoms of ulcers, what medications are ordered, what type of teaching you should do with the patient, and how to prevent the dumping syndrome. Let's take a look at the different types of ulcers. The first type of ulcer we'll discuss is a chronic duodenal ulcer. Let's take a look at the type of patients or clients that develop duodenal ulcers. Frequently, it's a male, 25 to 30 years old. They usually have type O blood, and they have a good diet. It's not that they have, um, are malnourished in any way. The secretions show a low gastric pH. These clients frequently complain of pain about two to three hours after they've eaten, and they find that eating actually relieves their pain. These clients do experience melana, and usually chronic duodenal ulcers are not malignant. Now let's compare the chronic duodenal ulcer with a chronic gastric ulcer and take a look at the differences. First of all, a chronic gastric ulcer usually is seen, in, again, in a male, but a little bit older this time. Usually they're about 45 years old. These clients do have nutritional deficits, and their gastric pH is normal rather than low. These clients experience pain about one hour before they eat or when they're fasting, and the pain is not relieved by eating, but it's relieved by vomiting. These clients do have hematoemesis, which is bloody vomiting, and the chronic gastric ulcer may become malignant. Let's take a look at the type of treatments or implementations are, that are done for ulcers. First of all, one of the more frequent impl implementations is that the client is put on small, frequent feedings. The client is taught to avoid coffee, alcohol, and any seasoning that irritates them. They are told to reduce stress, which is sometimes easier said than done. They are put on medications, and the type of medications they're put on are antacids, such as Maalox, and these are usually taken one hour before meals or one hour after meals. They're put on H2 blockers, such as cimetidine, and these are usually taken with meals. They're put on anticholinergic, such as probanthine, and these are usually taken about 30 minutes before, their, before meals. And the cytoprotective agents, such as caraphate, 
And these are, again, given about one hour before meals. Let's talk about some other implementations for ulcers. Surgery may be done. Also, either before or after surgery, gastric decompression may be um, implemented. Clients that have surgery for ulcers frequently need a replacement of vitamin B, vitamin B12, which is cyanocobalamin, IM, and this is required for the rest of their life. One of the teachings after the type of surgery for ulcers is you want to teach the client what they can do to prevent what is known as dumping syndrome. Remember, dumping syndrome is a rapid passage of food into the stomach without it undergoing chemical changes. The type of signs and symptoms you see for dumping syndrome are diaphoresis, diarrhea, and hypotension. The type of things that will help the client prevent dumping syndrome is to restrict fluid with meals, meaning the meals are eaten dry and the fluids are taken in between the meals, not with the meals. The client is also instructed to lie down after eating. Now remember with hiatal hernia, we said we didn't want that done, but after surgery for ulcers, we will instruct the client to lie down. What it does is it delays gastric emptying, and it allows the food to stay in the stomach long enough so it can't undergo chemical decomposition. Again, small frequent meals rather than three large heavy meals will help prevent dumping syndrome, and the client frequently is put on a low-carbohydrate, low-fiber diet. You'll remember that carbohydrates are the first food substances to leave the stomach. So if the client is on a low-carbohydrate diet, the food will remain in the stomach longer so it won't rapidly pass out of the stomach and cause the dumping syndrome. Let's change focus a little bit here and let's begin talking about esophageal atresia or tracheoesophageal fistulas. Let's talk first about the type of assessment you'll see with this type of malformation of the esophagus. Under assessment, Frequently, the child that has this will have stomach distension. They will be choking, coughing, and may become cyanotic. Again, remember this is a malformation of the esophagus that frequently ends in a blind pouch. The implementation that is done preoperatively, because surgery is the treatment of choice, preoperatively you will undergo methods or measures to prevent the aspiration of the child's saliva, and they will facilitate gastrostomy drainage. What they do after surgery, again, you want to suction the child to make sure the airway remains patent, and they will begin oral feedings according to patient tolerance. Let's change again and talk a little bit about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. These are two frequently tested topics on the NCLEX. The type of questions you will see regarding Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis are the symptoms, the medications used, the dietary changes that are required, Additionally, care of an ileostomy, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Also, the type of teaching that is done for patients with both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Let's talk about the two disease processes now, and we'll start with Crohn's disease, which is also known as regional enter enteritis. Remember, Crohn's disease is, is an inflammatory condition of the ileum and ascending colon. The type of patients that it involves or where it is seen is usually they are 20 to 30 years old. The client will have mucus, pus, or fat in the stool. They usually experience what is known as a colicky pain in their lower right quadrant. They do experience vomiting and diarrhea. They usually come to the physician, and by then they have experienced weight loss. They're dehydrated, and there may already be a fistula that has formed. Let's talk a, lot, a little bit about what the analysis or what is Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease or regional enteritis involves all layers of the submucosa of the intestinal tract. It is chronic and extensive, and it is slowly progressive. Now let's compare what we know about Crohn's disease with what we know about ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis is, again, an inflammation condition of the colon, but let's take a look at who it involves and what's involved with it. First of all, ulcerative colitis is seen in 20 to 40-year-old people, the clients experience rectal bleeding and pus and mucus are found in the stool. They have abdominal pain and usually the abdominal pain is pre-defecation, meaning they experience it before they defecate. Again, they also have vomiting and diarrhea, but they might experience fecal incontinence. They also have weight loss and they're also dehydrated. Now with, with ulcerative colitis, 
This involves the mucosa and submucosa, and the client will experience both remission and relapses. Let's take a look at the type of treatment that is done for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. First of all, they will put the client on a high-protein, high-calorie, low-fat, low-fiber diet. They need the protein, they need the calories, because again, we, remember we said that they had weight loss, but low-fat, low-fiber. If necessary, they will put the client on TPN, or total parenteral nutrition, to rest the bowel. They will give them medications, and the type of medications they will receive are analgesics, anticholinergics, antibiotics, to prevent or treat any concomitant infection, and corticosteroids because they will help reduce inflammation. A key nursing point is to maintain fluid and electrolytes, and the treatment of choice for these problems frequently is an ileostomy. Let's change focus a little bit here and go from Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and begin talking about appendicitis. Appendicitis is a frequently tested topic. The type of questions that usually concern appendicitis are, first of all, the symptoms of appendicitis versus other abdominal problems. Secondly, what is contraindicated if a person has abdominal pain? And the third thing is post-op care after an appendectomy. Let's take a look at the signs and symptoms you'll see with appendicitis. The patient will usually present with pain in the lower right quadrant, which is known as McBurney's point. The client may also be anorexic and experience vomiting. They may have either diarrhea or constipation, but there will be some change in bowel habits. They frequently present with a rigid abdomen. They may have fever and leukocytosis. Remember, leukocytosis is an elevation in the white blood cell count. Normal white blood cells are 5,000 to 10,000. So leukocytosis would be above 10,000. Let's talk about what you would do or what the implementations are for appendicitis. Well, first of all, a diagnosis of this problem is critically important to differentiate it from other problems. The first thing you do, well, this is kind of what you don't do. The things that are contraindicated with abdominal pain that may be appendicitis is no heating pads, no enemas, and no laxatives preoperatively. If the patient has appendicitis, this could cause a perforation of the appendix and would end up then with you know, abdominal problems and widespread infection. Analgesics are not given until the cause of the abdominal pain is determined. You don't want to mask the signs and symptoms of perhaps a perforating appendix. The patient will be NPO. Perhaps, if necessary, for relief of pain, an ice bag could be applied to the abdomen. And these clients are usually most comfortable in the Fowler's position. Remember, Fowler's position is an elevation of the head of the bed 45 to 60 degrees. Again, they do an appendectomy. And after the surgery, again, the Fowler's position is most comfortable for these patients because it relieves stress on the suture line. But we get them up and out of bed walking again to prevent the hazards of immobility. Let's talk a little bit about diverticular disease. You remember diverticular disease is inflammation of pouches or sacs in the intestinal wall. Let's talk about the type of assessment or what patients look like that have diverticular disease. These patients may experience colicky pain, usually found in the lower left quadrant. They usually come in and they have fever, and they have leukocytosis. Again, remember, elevation in WBC count indicates inflammation infection. These patients, again, there's some change in bowel habits. Either they have constipation or diarrhea. They may have, be experiencing vomiting, and when you listen to their bowel sounds, they will, they will be decreased. Implementation for diverticular disease. These patients are given analgesics, also antispasmodics and antibiotics again, to prevent or treat any infection. These patients will be NPO or will be put on a clear liquid diet. And if the diverticular disease gets severe, they could do a temporary transverse colostomy to rest the bowel. Again, the transverse colostomy would be chosen because it could later be reanastomosed together and closed. And again, if a transverse colostomy is done, the body image issues are of paramount importance to the client. They should know that the temporary, that the colostomy is planned to be temporary and how to deal with it, and again, addressing body image issues.
Let's talk a little bit now about peritonitis. Again, peritonitis is what will happen if you have a perforated appendix or some other problem. It's inflammation of the peritoneal area. The type of questions on the NCLEX exam frequently will involve symptoms or nursing care for peritonitis. Let's talk about peritonitis. It is inflammation of the parietal and visceral surfaces of the abdominal cavity. The type of assessment you will see, these patients usually have severe abdominal pain. And again, you need to make sure if a patient has appendicitis, appendicitis versus peritonitis, you need to do a differential diagnosis, or that's what the physician is involved with. With peritonitis, usually there is an, a rigid abdomen and decreased bowel sounds. Again, the patient presents with fever and leukocytosis, that is an elevation in WBCs. And the patient may have paralytic ileus. And again, with paralytic ileus, you would expect the bowel sounds to be decreased or absent. Let's talk about the implementation for peritonitis. These patients are put on antibiotics, usually IV, and usually the, the very powerful antibiotics that can be used. They're also given IV fluids, again, to maintain hydration. Gastric decompression is used. Again, you want to rest the bowel. And surgery, in some cases, may be done. Let's talk a little bit about Hirschsprung's disease. Hirschsprung's disease is a ganglionic disease of the intestinal tract. The type of assessment you will see. This happens frequently in children. They will complain or will present with chronic constipation and abdominal distension. The implementation for Hirschsprung's disease. Enemas are used along with a low-fiber, low-protein diet, and this is done preoperatively. Other nursing measures, you will measure the the child's girth at the level of the umbilicus and compare this day to day. Now, if the infant has this, it's imperative to do teaching with the parents and to foster infant parental bonding. I mean, there needs to be a bond there so that there's continuation of, of care and love between child and parent. A temporary colostomy may be done in this case, and again, you would need to teach the parents how to care for the child's colostomy. If it is temporary, which many times it is, the parents need to know that this is a temporary solution or it's something that's done temporarily to help the child. It will not be done long term. Let's talk a little bit about abdominal hernias. This is a frequently tested topic. The type of questions usually concern the symptoms seen and the type of terms you'll need to know how, what they mean. And these terms are reducible, non-reducible, incarcerated, and strangulated. And another type of question that you may see on the NCLEX would be with regard to nursing care after treatment for an abdominal hernia. Let's take a look at the type of things that you'll see for patients that have abdominal hernias. First of all, they may experience a lump in the abdomen that may disappear when they're laying flat or they're supine. If the hernia is strangulated, they will present with severe abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and distension. If the hernia is reducible, what that means is it can be replaced by manipulation. If the hernia is irreducible, that means it cannot be replaced by manipulation. If a hernia is incarcerated, that means that the intestinal flow is completely obstructed. And if a hernia is strangulated, that means that the blood flow and the intestinal flow are both obstructed. Let's talk about the type of treatment they do for intestinal hernias. Well, first of all, there's some preoperative things you want to be involved with. And the first is to assess the respiratory system. Check this patient's um, respirations, both their character and their amount. With the patient going to surgery, you will teach them to splint the incision postoperatively. And this teaching should take place preoperatively. So when the patient comes back from surgery, they'll know how to cough, cough to, and cough effectively, splinting the incision. After surgery, you want to make sure the client is able to void, and you want to relieve any urinary retention. If it's an inguinal hernia and the scrotum area becomes swollen, you can use ice packs. And the patient should be taught no pulling, pushing, or heavy lifting for six weeks. Because this would put a strain on the um, an abdominal area and could perhaps interfere with the um, fixing of the hernia by surgery. Let's talk about something that's similar to what we're talking about now, and that's intestinal obstruction. Remember, an intestinal obstruction may be mechanical 
or paralytic. For example, there's the absence of peristalsis. The type of things you will see under assessment if a client has an intestinal obstruction is, first of all, no bowel sounds or limited bowel sounds. There may be abdominal pain and distension, and there will be no stool or gas. Let's talk about the implementation for an intestinal obstruction. Laxatives and enemas are used if the obstruction is due to fecal impaction. They will also use tubes, NG tubes, such as the Levine or Salem sump tube, Miller-Abbott tubes, uh, which is a double lumen tube, or a canter tube. And remember, a canter tube is a single lumen tube that has a weighted bag of mercury that snakes its way through the GI tract. And again, surgery can be done for an intestinal obstruction to relieve or remove the obstructed area. Let's go on, and we're going to talk about cirrhosis. Cirrhosis, again, is a frequently tested topic, and the type of questions you may see on the NCLEX will deal with the symptoms of cirrhosis, the different types of cirrhosis, how to care for or the treatment of esophageal varices, and how to care for a patient that has a sense taken Blakemore tube. Let's take a look at what you'll see if a client has cirrhosis. One of the cardinal symptoms is indigestion. There may also be flatulence or gas, and then either constipation or diarrhea. There will be some change in normal bowel elimination. The patient may experience anorexia and resultant weight loss. The patient may develop esophageal varices, and we'll talk about these when we talk about some of the complications of cirrhosis. The patient may also develop ascites, and remember ascites is fluid in the abdomen. The patient may develop jaundice, and again, it's one of the cardinal symptoms of cirrhosis. It's the yellow coloring of the skin and sclera. And they may also develop paritis, which is itching. Usually, a patient with cirrhosis, their urine becomes dark. It starts light, it becomes dark, and their stools, which usually start dark, become light. So dark urine and clay-colored stools, again, is a symptom of cirrhosis. Now, there are different types of cirrhosis, and let's differentiate the different types. The first type of cirrhosis is Lanx cirrhosis. This is caused by alcoholism and poor nutrition. The second type of cirrhosis is the biliary cirrhosis. This is due to chronic ciliary obstruction and infection. The third type of cirrhosis is the post-necrotic cirrhosis. This is due to a previous uh, bout of viral hepatitis. Now, if a client develops cirrhosis, one of the things we want to prevent and be on the lookout for are the complications of cirrhosis. And let's talk about those now. The type of complications that can occur with cirrhosis are, first of all, portal hypertension. What this means is elevation of blood pressure throughout the portal venous system. Again, this is what portal hypertension is. The second, and this is a very serious complication of cirrhosis, is esophageal varices. Esophageal varices are dilated veins in the submucosa of the lower esophagus. And this can be a life-threatening situation if these varices get torn and bleed. The patient can hemorrhage very quickly. Let's talk about the type of treatment that is done for cirrhosis. Well, if the client has portal hypertension, they can insert a shunt to relieve this. You, it's kind of like a bridge around um, uh, an area in the road that is broken up. They'll put a shunt in to kind of shunt around the area that is congested, and this will help relieve the portal hypertension. If they have cirrhosis, and this is early in the, um, the course of the disease, they will usually be put on a high-protein, high-carbohydrate diet. And again, remember, this is early in the disease process. If a client has um, continuing cirrhosis and late in the disease process, many times fiber, protein, fat, and sodium will be restricted. Again, this is later in, they've had the disease for a while and different things need to be done. The nurse will be involved in alleviating dry, itchy skin, because remember we said the paritis was one of the symptoms of um, cirrhosis. Again, the sodium and fluid restrictions may need to be done. If the person has a esophageal varices, they can use what is known as injection scler sclerothermy. Again, injection sclerothermy. What they do here is they inject a substance that causes sclerosis or fibrosis of the varices. It closes them off 
and it decreases the danger of hemorrhage due to those varices bleeding or rupturing. Type of medications they give to patients with cirrhosis are diuretics, vasopressin, and the reason vasopressin is used is it lowers the portal pressure, which is what's needed, and propranolol. Now, one of the things you need to remember about cirrhosis is you need to administer medications very carefully. Remember way back in nursing school when you first learned about medications, you found that many medications that are given patients are detoxified by the liver. If someone has cirrhosis, you have to be very cautious because the liver, because of its weakened state, may be unable to detoxify the medications. So you might want to, and the physician will be very cognizant of this, he, will be, he or she will be very careful in the amount of medication prescribed for these patients. The patient may need a lower dose because the liver will be unable to detoxify these medications. Let's take a look at a type of tube that is used to treat esophageal varices that are a complication of cirrhosis. This is a sense taken Blakemore tube, and you will note that it has three openings. The first opening is the gastric balloon. The second opening, when well, the gastric balloon is a very small balloon, um, round balloon that's kind of close to the tip. The second opening is an esophageal balloon. This is a long kind of tubular shaped balloon that is inflated to actually put pressure against the bleeding varices. And it's important for you to remember that this balloon, the esophageal balloon, should not be left in place um, you know, inflated for longer than 24 hours. It could cause necrosis of the area. And the third lumen or opening in the sense taken Blakemore tube is the gastric aspiration lumen. This is what is used for um, iced uh, fluids to go in for lavage. This will freeze and cause vasoconstriction to hopefully prevent um, bleeding of the varices. Again, the type of tube, you should be familiar with the tube, and again, what the nursing responsibilities are with regard to the Sensteke and Blakemore tube. Let's talk a little bit about jaundice. We said jaundice was seen with patients that have cirrhosis. There's other causes of jaundice. Now you'll remember that jaundice is the yellowish or greenish yellow discoloration that's seen on the skin and the sclera. Usually if a client has jaundice, they have changes in the color of both their urine and their stools. They have dark colored urine, it should be light and it becomes dark, and they have clay-colored stools. It changes the normal color that you see of stools. And usually clients with jaundice complain of pruritus. This is the itching that happens with the accumulation of bile salts in the skin. Now, there are different types of jaundice. Let's talk about the different types. First of all, there's hemolytic jaundice. Now, hemolytic jaundice is seen with transfusion reactions and erythroblastosis fetalis. Another type of jaundice is the hepatocellular type of jaundice. And this is the type you will see with cirrhosis, which is what we were just talking about. So the hepatocellular jaundice is caused by cirrhosis. It's also seen with hepatitis. Let's talk about the third type of jaundice. This is obstructive jaundice. With obstructive jaundice, there's something obstructing the normal passage of bile and bile salts. In this case, it can be caused by cholelithiasis or tumors that actually obstruct the flow. Let's talk about the, what you would do or the treatment, also nursing care for jaundice. First of all, you need to help the physician identify and then treat the underlying cause. If it's due to a transfusion reaction, the treatment will be slightly different than if it is due to a tumor, which is obstructive jaundice. You want to pr promote measures that relieve pruritus. Again, you know, you would not use soap when bathing this person. You would use, um, you know, cool to warm water, um, no real irritating um, clothing. They would wear cotton clothing that breathes. These patients with jaundice are also given antihistamines. And many times Questran is ordered. Now, you'll remember that Questran binds with, ball, binds with bile salts in the intestine, and it's given with meals and at hour of sleep. Let's take a look at something we just mentioned, and that is um, we were talking a little bit about the gallbladder and problems with it. Let's talk about cholecystitis and cholelithiasis. Again, this is something that is frequently tested. What you will need to know for the NCLEX is 
the symptoms of cholecystitis and cholelithiasis, the risk factors, who develops problems with this, preoperative and post-op care, what output you would expect to see from a T-tube. And we're going to talk about a T-tube in greater length in just a few minutes. And you need to know how to care for a T-tube. Okay, under assessment for cholelithiasis and cholecystitis. Many times the patient will complain of intolerance to fatty foods. Now, patients that develop cholelithiasis and cholecystitis, sometimes an easy way to remember this is they say that they're the three Fs. Fair, meaning women develop it more often than med, men. Fat, meaning sometimes the women are overweight, and 40. So fair, fat, and 40 are the three Fs, and that's typically... Um, what type of patient or a frequent patient that develops both cholecystitis and cholelithiasis. In addition to the intolerance to fatty foods, they develop general indigestion. They have nausea, flatulence, and again, remember, this is gas. They eructate quite frequently, which is the medical terminology for burping. They experience severe right upper quadrant abdominal pain. They have leukocytosis. Remember, this is elevation in white blood cell count due to in, either inflammation or infection, and they become diaphoretic. The type of risk factors for cholelithiasis and cholecystitis. Let's take a look at these. One is obesity, and I talked about that a minute ago. Another one is a sedentary lifestyle, people that um, are not real active. Again, I said that women are more likely to develop cholecystitis and cholelithiasis than men. And many times they're 50 to 60 years old, so they're, they're slightly older or they're about middle age. Pregnancy is a risk factor for cholecystitis and cholelithiasis, as is diabetes mellitus. And again, you will see this disorder when clients have an increase in serum cholesterol because it precipitates out. Let's talk about what you do for implementation for cholecystitis and cholelithiasis. Well, the type of things that you will do, you will administer antibiotics, analgesics, and antispasmodics. The patient in the acute phase will remain NPO. You don't want anything stimulating the gallbladder in this case. And gastric decompression may be used. If the uh, condition gets severe, they may have blood transfusions and also the administration of vitamin K to help with bleeding and nutritional supplements may be used. Now they do surgery as a treatment for cholecystitis and cholelithiasis. Let's talk about the different types of surgery and the different type of treatments that can be used. Now you'll remember that a cholecystectomy is removal, removal of the gallbladder. You'll remember that cholecystotomy is an opening into the gallbladder to remove stones. You'll remember that a cholecystotomy is an opening into the gallbladder to remove stones and a T-tube is inserted. Okay, let's go on and talk about some of the different types of surgery and treatment. They can do what is known as a laparoscopic laser cholecystotomy. In this case, they remove the gallbladder by laser through a very small opening um, using a laparoscope. So these are the people that come back from surgery with a Band-Aid or very small dressing in place. It's nowhere near as an invasive procedure as the traditional cholecystectomy. Another type of treatment that can be used for cholecystitis and cholelithiasis is called bilary lithotripsy. In this case, they use shock waves to break up or destroy the stones. And another type of treatment is called a percutaneous transhepatic bilary catheter insertion. In this case, they introduce a catheter to decompress the obstructed extrahepatic ducts. Let's talk about the type of nursing care and treatment that are done for cholecystitis and cholelithiasis. Well, you will be administering analgesics to your patient because remember, pain is one of the presenting symptoms. You will position the patient for comfort, and usually they will assume whatever position is most comfortable for them. You will monitor them for potassium and sodium loss. The type of diet they usually are put on is low-fat, high-carbohydrate, high-protein diet. You will check the T-tube drainage. Many times after a traditional cholecystectomy, they will come back from surgery with the T-tube in place. 
and you can expect that tea tube to drain anywhere from 500 to 1,000 milliliters a day initially. As time goes on, the tea tube will drain less and less fluid. Now remember, the tea tube is put in place to make sure that bile can drain through the common bile duct um, while the area is obstructed due to surgery. As time goes on and the area begins to heal, less fluid will come out the tea tube and more will go through the common bile duct because a tea tube is exactly what it sounds like. If things can't go this way, they will go down the long part of the tea. But as the edema in the area subsides, the bile will continue to flow as it should and less and less will be captured into the T2 bag. Again, you should know what the um, drainage looks like, how much to expect, how to treat the patient or, or teach the patient rather to care for the T2. Because frequently the patient will go home with a leg bag with a T2. And you need to know to observe the client for jaundice. After surgery, the jaundice that they developed or had initially should begin to subside. And again, their stools should become dark and their urine should become light. If at any time the jaundice reoccurs, the stools again revert to their light color or the urine reverts to its dark color, that tells you that there's an obstruction. It should be investigated thoroughly and reported to the physician. So again, these people should begin to get better and shouldn't revert back to some of the symptoms that they came in with. Let's talk about pancreatitis. Pancreatitis, again, frequently tested topic. The type of questions you may see deal with the symptoms of pancreatitis, the dietary changes that are needed, or the medications that are prescribed for clients with pancreatitis. Let's talk about pancreatitis. You remember that with pancreatitis, there is digestion of the pancreas by the enzymes it produces. So it's almost like a self-digestion um, process that's going on. Let's take a look at the assessment, what you will see for a client that has pancreatitis. Well, they usually present with severe abdominal pain. They have fever, again, because of the infection and inflammation, and they may have confusion. When you check their lab values, you will note that they have an ear an elevated serum amylase level, and they are hyperglycemic, meaning their blood sugars are high. Remember, normal is 60 to 110 um, milligrams per deciliter. Let's take a look at the implementation for pancreatitis. In the acute phase, the patient will be NPO, and they will be undergoing gastric decompression with the use of a nasogastric tube. Many times the patients, they will have ordered antacids, such, of, such as Maalox, they will have antibiotics ordered and anticholinergics ordered. The patient is most comfortable in a semi-fowler's position. Remember, this is the head of the bed elevated 30 to 45 degrees. The type of diet that they are most comfortable with after the initial NPO and gastric decompression, as they begin to get better, they will put them on a low-fat, bland diet with small frequent feedings. And again, it's done to patient tolerance. If they begin not to tolerate the diet, again, they may put them back to NPO and reinstitute the gastric decompression. Okay, let's, we've talked about the GI tract for a while. Let's change focus a little bit. And we're going to begin talking about systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE. You remember that SLE, or lupus, is a chronic systemic autoimmune collagen vascular disease. Again, it's chronic, it's systemic, it's an autoimmune disease that involves the collagen and the vascular system. Let's take a look at the signs and symptoms a patient would present with that has lupus. They will come in with joint swelling and pain. There is a characteristic butterfly rash, and it's usually seen on the nose and the cheeks. They may have pericarditis, and they will have pleural effusion. The type of implementation you will do or the type of treatment that they will undergo, they will be put on steroid therapy. Again, because this is an autoimmune disease, the steroid, steroid therapy will help with decrease the inflammatory response. They're also put on NSAIDs. Remember, NSAID stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. These are medications such as Motrin. And these people, you need to protect the skin from sunlight. They are very sensitive to sunlight. And um, if they live in a warm quiet where sunlight is around all the time, they need to wear long sleeved shirts, wear a hat, and again, protect their skin from sunlight. 
Okay, we're going to change focus completely here, and we're going to begin talking about perioperative care. Perioperative care, again, pre-op, operative, and post-op all comes under the big umbrella of perioperative care. Let's take a look at some of the things that are important with perioperative care. This is a frequently tested topic because it's something that occurs a lot. A lot of patients we care for go to and from surgery. The type of questions you may see on the NCLEX deal with the fears associated with surgery. This is especially true of children and adolescents, and we'll talk about those fears in just a minute. It's critically important that you know what type of teaching is needed both preoperatively and postoperatively. You need to know how to prepare different age groups for healthcare procedures. And this may be something as, as short as um, inserting an IV all the way up to a bronchoscopy, a lumbar puncture, or some of the more invasive involved procedures that we're going to be talking about. You need to know about informed consent. Who does what, who's responsible for what, and what, especially what the nurse's responsibilities are. You're going to need to know about preoperative and postoperative care. And you need to know both how to recognize, but more importantly, how to prevent complications of surgery. Let's begin by talking about some of the fears of surgery. Remember I said this was critically important. If you're dealing with infants, you really will be dealing mainly with the parents. But when you get to up to toddlers, they have fears that need to be addressed by the nursing nurse during the nurse's care. The type of fears a toddler has regarding surgery are separation. And again, you, it's very helpful, in fact, it's critically important to teach the parents what to expect and how they can help the child during this difficult time. A preschool child is afraid of mutilation. And one of the ways to help a preschool child get through this issue or through this time period is to help them express their feelings. Explain to them briefly and in a child's language what will go on, um, what they can expect, what they can do to help themselves. A school-aged child fears loss of control. These are the children that are just beginning to be independent, and they glory in their independence. So because they fear loss of control, whenever possible, allow them to make choices, even small choices. Do you want to do this now or this? Again, any control we can give them through the use of choices will help them through this difficult time. Now, adolescence. This is a difficult time. Again, an adolescent fears loss of independence. Again, they have recently become uh, emancipated. They believe they're emancipated. They also fear change in body image. When you're an adolescent, you are what you look like or you are what your peers think that you are. So these are two fears, both the loss of independence and any change in body image. So surgery is really a very fearful idea or concept for an adolescent. The ways we can help them through this situation is to involve them in the procedures, let them know exactly what's going to be going on, and point out any strengths or abilities they have. Again, get them involved in their own care and make sure to keep them as independent as possible. Again, allow them choices. Would you like to do this or this? You know, this has to be done. It can be done now or I can come back in 10 minutes. Again, that type of thing puts control back in their hands. Let's talk about the type of teaching that needs to be done preoperatively. These are people who are getting ready for surgery. And let's go through the different age groups of what's, what, how you would do the preoperative teaching. If you're dealing with toddlers, you want to make sure and keep the directions and the information you're giving them very simple. Again, remember the vocabulary ability of a toddler. They don't have a wide vocabulary. So very simple directions, simple sentences without a lot of phrases. If you're dealing with a preschool or a school-aged child, it's helpful to allow them to play with the equipment. Now, I'm not saying to give them a syringe with a needle and say, here, um, see what you can do with this. But a syringe without a needle, give them a stethoscope to play with, give them you know, some kind of bandage or something. Let them feel it and play with it. Um, they can also play with their dolls and give their dolls injections and that type of thing. What it does is it takes away the fear of the unknown. Again, the child's comfortable so when you approach them with a the stethoscope, they know that this is just something that you're, you're going to use to listen to something. It's not something that's going to hurt them. 
Okay, with an adolescent, if you're doing preoperative teaching, you can expect resistance. They're kind of, they may dig in their heels um, and say, I'm not going to do this or that type of thing. So if you expect this, again, going in, you can work with the adolescent to, again, you know, make sure that they know what they need to do after surgery. And again, let them know why they need to do it. If you do these exercises, or for example, if you splint your incision when you cough, then you won't hurt as much. Okay, another thing you want to do with teaching preoperatively is you want to involve the family in the teaching, not just the child or the adolescent, but the family. And make sure the family knows enough and then they can go back and reinforce the teaching. Now let's talk about how you would prepare the different age levels for healthcare procedures. And let's begin with newborn. Now a newborn fears loud noises and sudden movements. So if you're going to prepare a newborn for a healthcare procedure, you want to make sure and not startle this child. You want to move slowly and carefully and make sure and keep noises to a minimum. Again, involve the parents. Frequently, a mummy restraint is used to prepare a newborn for a procedure because you can't reason with a newborn. So they will wrap them up tightly, be it again safely, to prepare them for a procedure. When you're dealing with a 6 to 12 month old child, these people, this age group, fear strangers and heights. So again, you want to make sure the child has seen you and knows you before you go in to do a procedure. And you wouldn't put them on a high table. Um, you'd kind of, they're afraid of things that are high, so you would want to work. And again, you want to get down to their level and look them in the eye when you're talking with them. And it is also helpful to model desired behavior. Okay, continuing forward, if we are preparing a toddler for a healthcare procedure. The, this group, age group, fears separation, animals, and changes in the environment. So again, knowing that, you will provide very simple explanations and you will use distraction. Again, you know, they, they're easily distracted, so make that into a positive. And again, allow them choices whenever possible. Now, if you're preparing a preschool child for a healthcare procedure, this age group fear separation, they fear ghosts and scary people. So what you would want to do is you would want to involve play with them. Use puppets or dolls to kind of show them what's going to happen and where they're going to be and in what position. And again, it takes away the fear of the unknown. So you demonstrate the equipment. Again, let them play with the equipment. And again, get down to their eye level and talk with them rather than from a tall distance. Again, adults are scary to preschool children. We're so much bigger and we talk so much louder that if we get down to their eye level and really talk with them face to face, it's much less intrusive and scary for that child. Let's talk about preparation of healthcare procedures for a school age child. This age group fears the dark, they fear injury, they fear being alone, and they fear death. So allow them to ask questions and answer their questions to the best of your ability. Explain why. Because this is what the child's going to say. Why do I have to have this shot? Why do I have to go and have surgery? Why do I have to have this? So again, let them know again short, simple sentences. Don't overpower them with the information, but answer the questions that are presented. And again, allow them to handle the equipment. Let's go on with preparation for healthcare procedures in the adolescent stage. Adolescents fear social incompetence, horror that they would be incompetent or would stand out from their peers. They also fear war, accidents, and death. So what you will do for an adolescent to prepare them for a healthcare procedure is it, it's helpful to explain the long-term benefits for whatever it is, the healthcare procedure that they're going to undergo. And privacy is crucially important. Make sure and pull the drapes. They don't want everyone to hear the fact that they're going to have, you know, a mole removed or, I mean, they're very cognizant of, of body limits and privacy. And it's very helpful if we address these issues as we work with this age group. Let's talk about the type of thing that I'm sure you are all familiar with, which is a pre-op checklist. The type of things that are involved in a pre-op checklist. First of all, you need to make sure the informed consent form is signed. And this has to be done before the patient is medicated for surgery. You need to make sure that the lab tests, chest x-ray and EEG, or I'm sorry, EKG, if ordered, is on 
the chart if it's there and if the results are abnormal they need to be brought to the physician's attention before the patient is medicated for surgery there may be skin or bowel preps that are done and these may start a week before surgery they may start a couple days before surgery might be done the night before or the morning of surgery again make sure the patient has undergone all bowel and skin preps an IV may be started in the patient's room before surgery as may TPN. Again, they want the patient to be in good nutritional st standing when they go to surgery so the body can heal itself after surgery. In some cases, the IV is started in the um, operative holding room. The patients need to be NPO. And again, usually it's from midnight the day before. Remember, we don't want this patient to aspirate stomach contents. And if we know the stomach is empty, there will be nothing um, if the patient gets nauseated, nothing to aspirate. Again, it's a big safety issue. And if clients come in for outpatient surgery, they haven't been under our roof, so we need to question them very carefully about the last time they ate and what they ate. And this needs to be done more than once. And it should be done both with the client that is undergoing surgery and also any significant others that came with them. Because the client may have forgotten that cup of coffee they had as they ran out the door. Sedation and antibiotics many times are given preoperatively. And again, the sedation many times are called pre-op medications, prelim medications. Antibiotics may be started before surgery or may be started immediately after surgery. This again is to prevent any type of infection um, because surgery is a very invasive procedure. When you're sending a patient to surgery, you need to remove their dentures. Now some patients are very um, they don't want their dentures removed before they leave. In that case, you would send them to surgery with a denture cup right next to them, and they can keep their dentures in, but take them out before they actually go into the surgical holding room. Other things you will remove is any and all jewelry. Now, sometimes the patient cannot get the ring off or chooses not to take a ring off. In that case, you will tape it to the finger to make sure that it stays in place. Again, Cautiously tape it. We don't want to have any gangrene of the finger because we've cut off the circulation. Again, nail polish should be removed for women. That's because we want to be able to check the blanching sign after surgery. And if they have bright red nail polish, we will, we will be unable to assess their nail beds. Other things you want to ask about. Some patients have artificial prosthesis, like an artificial eye. You would want to ask the patient, if do you have anything? Artificial eye, um, you know, fixed or uh, loose bridge, I mean, that type of thing. And again, remove those things before surgery. Okay, let's talk about the type of teaching you will do for patients that are going to surgery. Well, first of all, and one of the most important things you'll do, and this overrides everything else, is you will talk with the patient about their concerns. You will ask them if they have concerns. You'll talk about what their feelings are, what they know about what's going to go on, how you can help them understand it better. You will let them know about the pre-op procedures. You will tell them about the removal of the jewelry. And many times the best thing to do is to send it home with a significant other. You'll let them know that that beautiful manicure that she just had, you're going to have to remove that nail polish. But let her know why. It's that we need to assess your nail beds to make sure that your circulation is adequate postoperatively. Let them know what kind of medications they're going to get before surgery, how they're going to get them. Is it a pill I'm going to take? Is it an injection? Will I get it IV? And also let them know about the skin and bowel prep. You're going to do a surgical scrub 20 minutes for the two days before surgery. Or you're going to have enemas till clear the morning of surgery. Again, they need to know what is going to be going on with them. They need to know what's going to happen post-operative. And they need to know what type of activities they're going to be engaging in or will need to engage in after surgery. These are things such as deep, deep breathing exercises, leg exercises, and the use of the incentive spirometer. And they need to know what's going to be done about any pain that they have. Again, they need to know that pain medication will be available, and they either they need to ask for it or we'll be checking with them, and it will be given IV. They might have a PCA pump or a patient-controlled analgesic pump under their control. But these are just some of the things that are need to take place with the client before we send them to surgery. Let's take a look at the patient in surgery. A little about nursing care for the patient that's anesthetized. 
Well, one of the things you want to do once the patient is in the surgical suite is they are continuously monitored. Their vital signs need to be continuously monitored because remember, with anesthesia, their level of consciousness is decreased and clients are unable to maintain their own airway. They rely on us to make sure the airway is patent. We need to make sure during surgery that a septic technique remains unbroken. This is sterile technique. We want to make sure the patient does not um, have any type of infection because of the surgical procedure. All electrical equipment used in surgery needs to be grounded. Uh, we're not out to electrocute people here with ungrounded equipment. Fluid balance is critically important. The patient, as we said, may have an IV before surgery. Chances are very good they will come back to the room with an IV in place. It's imperative to replace the fluids that are lost during surgery. And with surgery, they will do a sponge and instrument count. That means that they will count how many sponges were used. They will account for all their instruments before they close the patient up. And I'm sure you've all heard of some horror stories where um, they have a little something extra left in the patient. That shows that there was some break in the normal activities that should have taken place in the surgical suite. Okay, let's talk about post-op care. Our patient, we've done excellent pre-op teaching. They know what was going to go on. They made it through surgery. They know, don't have an infection. They're in good shape. They're back under our care now. What type of treatment or care will we do with the patient after surgery? Well, one of the first things we'll do is to stimulate the patient to wake them up. And we will, we will want to monitor their level of consciousness. Initially, it will be depressed, but it, they should become more alert as time goes on. We will monitor their vital signs very carefully and very closely and very frequently. Most hospitals have a protocol. In many places, it's Q 15 minutes times 4 once they're back on the general med surge floor, Q half an hour times 2, Q um, hour times two, you know, and the different regimes. And again, but you need to know that the vital signs are monitored very, very carefully and very frequently. You will monitor a patient's intake and output and perhaps central venous pressure after surgery. The physician doesn't have to tell us that it's essential for us as nurses to monitor intake and output. We know because the patient has undergone surgery and the fact that they may have a fluid and electrolyte imbalance how critically important it is for us to monitor their intake and output. We will also look at their lab values. And again, monitor electrolytes. One of the more important ones is potassium. Remember, potassium is your main intracellular ion. When cells are destroyed or are, are um, interfered with, potassium is released. So we need to make sure the patient doesn't become hyperkalemic or hypokalemic. And we'll want to listen and check breath sounds. You need to know what normal breath sounds are, where you will hear them, and you also need to know about adventitious breath sounds and where you will hear them and what they sound like and what they mean. Other things we'll do postoperatively. We will turn, cough, and deep breathe this client splinting the wound. Now there are some situations where coughing is contraindicated. There are some types of eye surgery or ear surgery where this is not done. But for the general post-op patient, unless contraindicated, we will TCDB, meaning turn, cough, and deep breathe them routinely after surgery. You will offer pain medication. And we, when we talked about pain, we said that if you expect pain to occur in a period, you want to be preemptive in your treatment of the patient. If you offer pain medication more frequently, the patient spends less time in pain and it takes less medication to relieve the pain that they have. You want to use an incentive spirometer. And remember we talked about the incentive spirometer. This helps with the patient's inspiratory, you know, opening up of the airways and making sure that they have a patent airway after surgery. You want to check bowel sounds. And again, you listen to the bowel sounds. The books say for five minutes in each of the four areas. On the NCLEX exam, you have 20 minutes to listen to bowel sounds. So if they say listen to bowel sounds, you know there are four places to do it, and you're going to do it for five minutes each. And I know you're all laughing out there because you don't do it in real life, or what my students used to say, the real world, Mrs. Burkhart. We don't do it. 
I understand that, but for this exam, you will be able to do it. You will have the time. You want to make sure the patient remains NPO until the gag reflex returns or the physician, well, and the physician has ordered the patient to receive something by mouth. And while they're NPO and even after they begin to eat, you want to make sure the patient has good mouth care because the mouth area gets very, very dry. And you will check for the first passage of stool or flatus. What this tells you is the GI tract has woken up, it's awake now, and peristalsis has resumed because the patient will be unable to eat until they have an active GI tract because paralytic ileus is one of the complications or something that can be seen after surgery. Let's continue with talking about the type of things we'll do after surgery. You will check pulses, especially if there are any... Um, if the surgery was done in a particular area, we will check pulses distal to the area of surgery. After surgery, you do not allow the patient to cross their legs, and you do not elevate the knee gatch. Many times it's a very common position, especially for women to assume. Make sure they know that this will impair or inhibit the circulation in the extremities and can foster the development of thrombus. So they need to know not to do it. One of the things that some physicians will order preoperatively, in fact, the patient may go to surgery with them or they may come back from surgery and have them put on immediately, are TED hose, which are the anti-embolytic stockings. Now, when we're talking about possible thrombus, one of the things you will do with your post-op patients is to check Homan sign. Homan sign, remember, is pain on dorsiflexion of the foot. There's pain in the calf. If that occurs, that tells you that the patient has a thrombus and then this needs to be immediately reported. Patients that come back from surgery with incisions, you will look at the incision. If there's a dressing over the top, you will look at the dressing, and you'll see if the dressing's wet. You may mark the area of wetness, and again, outline it with a pencil or a pen, and put the time and the date. So when you come back in the room later, if the area is larger, you're able to describe that. It was this big, and now it's twice as large, and you'll be able to see that because you've outlined the drainage. But if they come back and they just have steri strips in place, or you can see the incision, you will take a look at the incision. Is it red? Is it well approximated? What type of sutures were used? Does it look good? If there's any drainage, you will both assess and document the amount of drainage and the, what it looks like. Is it serous? Is it sanguinous? Is it purulent? Hopefully it's not purulent after surgery. Okay, you, again, you will document the amount and character of drainage, and when you change the dressing after surgery, usually the physician is responsible for changing the dressing the first time. When you change subsequent dressings, you need to use aseptic technique with all dressing changes. Again, sterile procedure 100% of the time. Let's talk about some of the complications that can happen after surgery. The first complication is hemorrhage. And again, the reason it may occur is because this is an invasive procedure. If the client develops hemorrhage after surgery, you will note that they have a decreasing blood pressure, an increasing pulse, and they become cold and clammy. These are your cardinal symptoms of shock. For implementation of hemorrhage after surgery, you will monitor vital signs very closely, very carefully, and the physician will order things to replace the blood volume. Might be RBCs, might be a plasma expander, depends on the extent of the problem. Let's take a look at another complication after surgery. And this is one I re referred to a little bit a few minutes ago. This is paralytic ileus. With paralytic ileus, this is when the GI tract stops because of the anesthesia. The patient will present with absence of bowel sounds. So remember, you're listening to bowel sounds after surgery, four quadrants, five minutes each quadrant. And you'll note that the patient has no bowel sounds, there's no passage of flatus or gas, and no passage of stool. What they will do with paralytic ileus is the patient will have an NG tube and will have nasogastric suction until peristalsis becomes reestablished. To maintain nutrition during this time, IV fluids will be given. They're given for both nutrition and for hydration. And in some cases, if the paralytic ileus is severe, they will use a decompression tube, such as the Miller-Abbott or the Cantor tube. Again, remember, the Cantor tube has the bag of mercury that will snake its way through the GI tract, hopefully open things up and get everything awake and, and going again. Let's take a look at another complication of surgery. 
This is atelectasis or pneumonia. Type of things you will see if a patient develops atelectasis or pneumonia postoperatively. They will have dyspnea or difficulty breathing. They will become cyanotic, which is the bluish color. They will cough. They will have tachycardia, which is an increase in pulse rate. They will have fever because of the infection. And usually they will develop pain on the side of the pneumonia. Now let's talk about the implementations or what we'll do for patients that develop pneumonia or atelectasis postoperatively. Well, one of the things we want to do is prevent this, and we can prevent this by turning, coughing, deep breathing our patients, also suctioning them. All of this will help prevent the development of atelectasis and pneumonia. If they develop it, though, you want to suction and make sure you want to maintain an open airway and get rid of the fluids that are there. Postural drainage will also help in this. Remember, this is where you use gravity to help the patient expectorate or get rid of the secretions they have. And they will put the patient on antibiotics, maybe IV, maybe oral antibiotics. Let's take a look at another complication after surgery. This is embolism. What you will see if the patient develops an embolism after surgery. They will have dyspnea, which is the difficulty breathing. They will have pain. They will have hemoptysis. Remember, hemoptysis is bloody sputum. The patient will become restless. And when you check their ABGs, which you will if you suspect embolism, they will have a low O2 and a high CO2. Implementation for embolism. You will put the patient on oxygen. This will help with the low O2 that you've identified. They give heparin IV for embolism. And remember, you should know about heparin. You should know how it works. You should know its antidote. And what's the antidote for heparin? Exactly, protamine sulfate. And what test do we use to identify or to evaluate heparin's effectiveness? Absolutely, it's the partial thromboplastin time, the PTT. In addition to heparin, this patient will receive IV fluids. Let's talk about another complication after surgery, and that's infection. What you will see if the patient develops an infection, they will have leukocytosis, again, elevation in WBCs. They will have a fever, and if you do a culture, it will come back positive. And it's a good idea to do the culture and identify what organism you're dealing with because the first thing under implementation is antibiotics. And the physician needs to make sure that the antibiotics that are ordered are specific for the organism that has been found. A septic technique needs to be reestablished if it's been broken, and good nutrition is important so the body has the building blocks to build back up after the infection. Let's take a look at another complication after surgery, and this is dehiscence. Remember, dehiscence is the separation of the wound edges. Remember back when we were talking about the assessments you do for a patient after surgery? One of the things I said is you want to look at the wound edges, and they should be well approximated. With dehiscence, the wound edges separate. So implementation, what you do, you will put the patient in low Fowler's position. Remember, this is like 15 to 30 degrees. It's not high up. It's 15 to 30 degrees elevation of the head of the bed. This patient should not be coughed any longer. It is dangerous to do that in this situation. They will instantly become NPO, and you will notify the physician. It may be necessary to take this patient back to surgery. Let's talk about another complication, which is evisceration. Evisceration is similar to dehiscence, but not only is there separation of the wound edges, it's worse. There is externalization of the bowel, meaning the bowel comes out of the wound. What you will do in this case, Again, you will put the patient in low Fowler's position. You will elevate the head of the bed 15 to 30 degrees. Again, this patient should not cough, and they will instantly become NPO. You will cover the viscera with sterile saline dressing. Again, you'll cover the viscera with a sterile saline dressing. If the patient is in the home setting when this occurs, because we send patients home more quickly all the time, you will tell them to get some saran wrap and cover the viscera. They shouldn't do it. Hopefully there's somebody with them who will go get the saran wrap and will cover the viscera to keep it moist. And you will notify the physician because this patient is going back to surgery. Another complication after surgery, psychosis. What you will see that will indicate psychosis after surgery is what we call an inappropriate affect. 
That's a very fancy way of saying the patient begins to behave strangely. Let's talk about the implementation for psychosis. You want to use therapeutic communication. And again, involve the client in their care. Begin to have them talk about what their feelings are and what they're thinking. And also medication in the way of antidepressives or antipsychotics may be ordered. Okay, that, we're not all the way through yet. Let's continue with another complication of surgery. We've got more. This is cardiovascular compromise. If the patient becomes compromised after surgery, what you will see is a decrease in blood pressure, an increase in pulse, and cold, clammy skin. What does it sound like to you? Yes, it sounds like shock. Let's take a look at the implementation for cardiovascular compromise. What you will do is you will treat whatever the cause is. If it is because they have lost volume, you will deal with volume. If it is because they have, um, you know, it's a neurogenic issue, you will deal with that issue. The patient, you will administer oxygen and you will administer IV fluids. Let's talk about another complication after surgery. This is urinary retention. What you will see if the patient is retaining urine after surgery, they will be unable to void. Now, all patients after surgery are due to void, and many hospitals abbreviated DTV, meaning due to void, at a certain time. And in most cases, that's eight hours or less, less after surgery. But the patient may be unable to void, and when you check them, which you will, you will note that the bladder is distended. The implementation for urinary retention is to catheterize the patient as needed. It may be a straight cath in and out, or it may be an indwelling Foley catheter. Another complication of surgery is, and we've got lots of them here, again, we want to prevent these, is urinary infection. If a patient gets a urinary tract infection or UTI after surgery, they will present with foul-smelling urine, and they will have leukocytosis, again, elevation in WBC. What you want to do for implementation, they will be put on antibiotics, and you will force fluids. Remember, normal intake is 2,000 cc's per day. So if you're forcing fluids, you will force to 3,000 cc's per day. And our last complication of surgery, deep vein thrombosis. What you will see if the patient develops a deep vein thrombosis is they will have a positive Holman sign. Remember, we talked about that. Pain in the calf with dorsiflexion of the foot indicates Homan's, or it's a positive Homan sign, and it indicates a deep vein thrombosis. The type of implementation you will do if they develop a deep vein thrombosis is you will expect the physician to order anticoagulants. And what anticoagulant would you expect? Yes, you'd expect him to start with heparin, perhaps IV, and then change to sub-Q. And they may be sent home on anticoagulants for ongoing if it gets to be an issue. Again, remember the type of things we do to prevent deep vein thrombosis. We want to do leg exercises routinely. The patient may go to surgery or come back with surgery or come back from surgery with TED hose in place. That will end part one of our discussion of physiological integrity three, reduction of risk potential. Hello and welcome. I'm Judy Burkhardt, National Director of the Nursing Programs for Kaplan. And welcome to part two of a discussion of Physiological Integrity 3, Reduction of Risk Potential. We're going to start by talking about diagnostic tests. Diagnostic tests are frequently tested on the NCLEX exam. And the type of things you'll need to know are, first and foremost, what's normal? What are normal lab values? You will need also to know that if lab values are abnormal, what that means. You will need to know how to prepare clients for tests and diagnostic procedures and also you know, um, therapeutic procedures that are going to be done with them. You'll also need to know how diagnostic procedures are performed. For example, if a lumbar puncture is done, how exactly does that take place and what nursing care should you give to the client? And you need to know how to prevent complications from diagnostic procedures. Okay, let's begin talking about some of the diagnostic procedures that are frequently tested. First one is a pulmonary function test. You'll remember that a pulmonary function test evaluates pulmonary function. To prepare the client, you will make sure that they do not smoke four hours before the test. You will also make sure that any bronchodilator medications are withheld. After the test, you will monitor for dyspnea to make sure the patient does not undergo or have any shortness of breath. Another type of test that is frequently tested 
is arterial blood gas, or ABGs. The type of things you need to know with an ABG is you need to know how to obtain it and where. You need to know what normal results are. You need to know if the results are abnormal, what that means. You need to know about care after the procedure. And you need to know the complications that you should both prevent with an ABG and how you would know if the patient was experiencing a complication. Let's talk about ABGs a little bit. To prepare the client for an ABG, you'll go get the equipment you need, and you will need a heparinized syringe. After you, observe, you obtain the specimen, you will apply pressure to the site for five minutes. Now, this will stretch to 15 minutes if the patient is receiving anticoagulants, such as Coumadin or heparin. You will send the specimen on ice with an occluded needle to make sure that air does not get in there. You will note on the lab slip if the patient was receiving oxygen. If they were, you will note the amount of oxygen they were receiving. If the patient is on room air, this will also be documented on the lab slip. After the specimen is obtained, you will check for swelling, discoloration, or any bruising, or areas of ecchymosis. You'll check for pain, numbness, and tingling of the hand. Let's talk about another type of diagnostic test which is a sputum analysis. With the sputum analysis, they obtain a specimen to identify the cause of pulmonary infection or to, to identify abnormal cells. Let's talk about what you do for a patient undergoing a sputum analysis. Well, first of all, you want to encourage fluids to liquefy their secretions. If the secretions are very tenacious or thick, it will be difficult for them to expectorate or raise up secretions. You will have the client rinse his mouth or her mouth with water. The client should not brush their teeth, eat, or use mouthwash immediately before the sputum analysis. You will, you will obtain the specimen in a sterile container, and it's best to collect it early in the morning, because most people have more secretions or sputum at that time. Let's talk about another respiratory type of diagnostic procedure, and that's a bronchoscopy. A bronchoscopy is where they visualize the trachea and main stem bronchi. What you'll need to know for bronchoscopy, because it is frequently tested, is how to prepare the client for the test, how the procedure is done, how to care for the client after the procedure, and the complications you should be looking for. So let's talk about that. How do you prepare a client for a bronchoscopy? Well, the client should be NPO for 6 to 12 hours before the test. They will receive pre-medication with medications such as Valium, Versed, or Demerol. You will remove their dentures before the procedure, and you will let them know that after the procedure, it is very common for them to experience a sore throat, but it will resolve as time goes on. When the patient returns to the room after the bronchoscopy, they will sit or lie on their side. We want to make sure that any secretions do not become aspirated. We want to allow for drainage of secretions. The patient will remain NPO until the gag reflex returns because during the bronchoscopy, they spray the throat with something that is an anesthetic that kind of paralyzes the area. So again, we will, the person will be NPO until we check the gag reflex and make sure for NCLEX you know how to assess a patient's gag reflex. And we'll also monitor the patient for respiratory difficulties. Let's talk about another type of diagnostic procedure. This is a thoracentesis. For a thoracentesis, what you will need to know or the type of question you may see on the NCLEX is, they may ask you about the preparation, how to get somebody ready for a thoracentesis. They may ask you about the procedure, the care after the procedure, or what complications should you be preventing, or how would you know if the patient is experiencing complications. Now let's talk about a thoracentesis. Remember, a thoracentesis is where they aspirate fluid or air from the pleural space. Let's talk about how to get pa the patient ready for this procedure. Well, first of all, you're going to obtain baseline vital signs. If the patient is quite hairy, you will sh shave around the insertion site. To undergo the procedure, the patient will be positioned with the arms on the overbed table or they will be positioned lying on their side. You will let the patient know to expect a tingling sensation when the um, local anesthetic is injected, and they may also feel a feeling of pressure. 
you need to remember that when they do a thoracentesis, no more than 1,000 cc's are taken at any one time. Okay, your patient's had the thoracentesis. Now what type of care will you do after the procedure? Well, first and foremost, it's essential for you to auscultate or listen to breath sounds. You should listen and you should know again what normal breath sounds are and what adventitious breath sounds are and if they occur, what that means. You'll monitor the patient's vital signs very closely and quite frequently. You will monitor the site of insertion where they did the thoracentesis for drainage, and there will be a sterile dressing to the site. Again, you need to maintain the sterility of this because you, it's an invasive procedure. You don't want the patient to end up with an infection. Let's talk about another procedure, and that's a lung biopsy. Remember with a lung biopsy, they remove lung tissue for culture or cytology. To get somebody ready for a lung biopsy, the patient will receive a sedative or an analgesic. To do the procedure, they will position them with their arms on the overbed table or lying on their side, very similar to what we did with the thoracentesis. After the lung biopsy, you will monitor the patient's vital signs and breath sounds very frequently and very carefully. What you're looking for is respiratory distress. If there is respiratory distress after the lung biopsy, a chest x-ray will be ordered because what they will be looking for is one of the complications of a lung biopsy, and that's a pneumothorax. Remember, a pneumothorax is when the negative pressure in the pleural space is interrupted and the lung collapses. After a lung biopsy, again, a sterile dressing will be placed or will be put in, in place. Let's talk now about a procedure that is done commonly or more and more all the time now, and that's the use of an MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. Remember, this uses magnetic fields to obtain detailed pictures of body structures. What you will do getting someone ready for an MRI is to assess them for claustrophobia. And what you don't do is say, are you claustrophobic? What you will say is, um, do you become anxious in tight places? Have you ever been in a relatively tight place? And again, describe what will be done with them. You need to make sure and remove any metal objects or jewelry. This includes earrings, rings, metals. You also need to ask the client if they have any metal implants in their body. It might be a hip prosthesis. It might be shrapnel from an earlier war. You need to know that because the Strong magnetic field will react negatively with metal that's implanted in the body. And after an MRI, there's no post-procedure. Nothing special needs to be done. Let's take a look at a test now, which is angiography. To prepare someone or with angiography, the type of questions you will see on the NCLEX usually deal with preparation for the procedure, the procedure itself, how to care for the patient after the procedure, and again, the complications that you will be both looking for and trying to prevent. Let's talk about angiography. It's the injection of a radiopaque dye to usually outline structures. To prepare the patient, you need to first remove all jewelry, and the client needs to know that they may experience nausea, flushing, a feeling of warmth, and a salty taste when the dye is injected. Because dye is used, it's critically important to assess a client's allergies before the injection of the dye. Because again, many patients are allergic or have allergic responses to this type of substance. After the test, after the angiography, you will assess for a hematoma, which is a collection of blood under the tissue. You will assess pulses distal to the injection site, and you will compare skin temperature, color, and sensation. This area with the contralateral or area on the opposite side of the body, and you will check vital signs. Okay, let's talk now about a different type of diagnostic procedure, and this is pulse oximetry. With pulse, pulse oximetry, you will prepare the client by cleaning a site, usually a finger, but can be an earlobe, using a cotton ball, soap and water, and then alcohol, and then you will dry the skin. You need to remember when using pulse oximetry that the site needs to be rotated every four hours to prevent skin irritation. Okay, another diagnostic test, frequently tested, cardiac catheterization. The type of things you need to know about a cardiac cath is 
First of all, preparation. How do you get a patient ready? How is the procedure done? Again, care after the procedure and what complications are you trying to prevent and how would you know if the patient had complications? Let's talk about a cardiac catheterization. Remember, this is an introduction of a catheter into the chambers of the heart. To get somebody ready for a cardiac cath, they will be NPO for 8 to 12 hours before the procedure. The patient will need to sign a permit because it is an invasive procedure. The client should empty their bladder before the cardiac catheterization, and you should check their pulse. Now, they need to know that during the procedure, they may experience a feeling of heat, palpitations, or a rapid heart rate, and a desire to cough when the dye is injected. If they know this ahead of time, they will not become anxious when suddenly they feel different than they did before. Let's talk about what you'll do when the patient comes back to the floor after the cardiac catheterization. Well, first and foremost, you will monitor vital signs, critically important. Also very important is you will check pulses, sensation, and bleeding at the insertion site. They will come back with a pressure dressing in place because many times they use the femoral area as an insertion site. Any change in pulses, sensation, any um, abnormal amount of bleeding should be thoroughly investigated and immediately reported to the physician. The patient will remain on bed rest six to eight hours after this test with the insertion extremity site straight. So if it is in the right femoral area, the patient's right leg will remain straight. Again, one of the complications after this is hemorrhage, and you don't want that to occur. So that's why the positioning is done after a cardiac catheterization. Let's go on and talk about another diagnostic procedure. This is an LP or a lumbar puncture. You'll remember that an LP is an insertion of a needle into the subarachnoid space, and it is used to obtain specimens, to relieve pressure, and to inject dyes or medications. The L an LP is, or lumbar puncture is frequently tested on the NCLEX because it's a common procedure done with patients. What you need to know for an LP? You need to know how to prepare a client for this procedure, how the procedure is accomplished, what to do after the procedure, and again, the complications that the patient may experience. Let's talk about getting somebody ready for an LP. What you will do is you will position them in the lateral recumbent fetal position at the edge of the bed. Again, they need to be at the edge so the physician can reach them to do the LP. Lateral recumbent is a side line, knees drawn up to the body, much like a fetal position. Then the physician will actually do the lumbar puncture, after the test, the nurse is responsible for doing a neurological assessment every 15 to 30 minutes. This patient will remain in the prone position two to three hours, and fluids are encouraged. The reason for the encouragement of fluids is to replace any fluids that were removed with the lumbar puncture. If the patient develops a headache, oral analgesics will be used, and the nurse is responsible for checking the site of the LP for drainage. Let's talk about another test now. Let's talk about an EEG or an electroencephalogram. Remember, an electroencephalogram is where it's a record of the electrical activity of the brain. Let's talk about how you would get somebody ready for an EEG. Well, first of all, tranquilizers and stimulant medications are withheld for 24 to 48 hours before an EEG. Other stimulants, such as um, caffeine, cigarettes are withheld for 24 hours before an EEG. The patient should be told what to expect during the test, and they may be asked to hyperventilate, meaning breathe very quickly during the test, because brain waves sometimes change when this action takes place. So the patient may be asked to do this during the test. Now you need to know that meals are not withheld before an EEG because if the patient becomes hypoglycemic, it will change the results of the test. And in some cases, the patient will be kept awake the night before the test because they want the patient to sleep during the test. So again, it's difficult, but you need to go in and we'll do what a lot of patients think we do anyway, which is wake them up all the time. Now let's talk about what you will do after the EEG. When the patient comes back from the EEG, you will help them remove the paste from their hair. Because during the test, they added paste and put electrodes into the scalp. 
so you'll help them wash their hair. Any medications that were withheld before the test will be administered, and you will observe for seizure activity. Because sometimes the medications that were withheld before the test or before the EEG are the anticonvulsants. So you have to be very cautious and make sure and assess for seizure activity. Let's talk about a different test now, which is a CAT scan. A CAT scan detects hemorrhage, abscesses, and tumors. To prepare a client for a CAT scan, if they're going to use contrast dye, you need to let them know that, again, they may feel flushed and get a very warm face and experience a metallic taste when the dye is injected. When the person comes back from a CAT scan, you need to assess them for an allergic response to the dye. And again, hopefully the nurse should have done what is supposed to be done before the surgery and assess allergies. And again, after a CAT scan, the nurse should encourage the client to drink fluids. Let's talk about another test now, liver biopsy. Liver biopsy, again, is a frequently tested topic on the NCLEX. The type of thing you need to know for liver biopsy, again, preparation for the procedure, how the procedure is done, the care after the procedure, and what complications are you looking for and try to prevent. Let's talk about getting somebody ready for a liver biopsy. Remember, a liver biopsy is where they obtain a sample of tissue from the liver by needle aspiration. What you will do to get somebody ready, you may need to administer vitamin K IM. Remember, the liver is responsible for some clotting factors, and you want to make sure that they don't hemorrhage after surgery. We're going to, or I'm sorry, after the liver biopsy. We're going to talk about that in a minute as one of the complications. So we want to give them vitamin K. The patient will be NPO for six hours before the liver biopsy. They may be given a sedative, and they need to know what the test involves. For example, they need to know that during the test, they will be asked to hold their breath for five to 10 seconds. This is when the aspiration is actually done. They need to know that they will be positioned in a supine position laterally with the upper arms elevated. That kind of raises um, the, the body up. After the liver biopsy, when they come back to the floor or when you begin care for them again, after this procedure, you will position them on the right side for one to two hours. This is a frequently tested topic on the NCLEX, and the reason you put them on the right side is it traps or positions, um, puts pressure on the area where they obtain the biopsy from to prevent the complication of hemorrhage. So we will position them after surgery, right side for one to two hours. And we will gradually elevate the head of the bed. 30 degrees the first hour, 45 degrees the second two hours. And the patient will remain on bed rest for 24 hours. You will check vital signs very frequently and very carefully. You will also check clotting time, platelets, and hematocrit. Remember, the liver is a highly vascular organ. And one of the complications that we want to prevent or pick up very quickly if it happens is hemorrhage. And you will report any severe abdominal pain. Now there is some abdominal pain that is expected after this type of procedure because they actually go in and take a piece out. But severe, um, unusual abdominal pain, different than before, should be investigated and immediately reported. Okay, let's take a look at the type of treatment they do or the type of diagnostic test which is endoscopy for the stomach and the esophagus. Remember, endoscopy is visualization use, using a lighted, flexible, fiber optic tube. Let's take a look at stomach and esophageal endoscopy. To prepare the client for this diagnostic procedure, they will be NPO for eight hours, and you need to let them know that something will be sprayed in their throat to numb the area. When they come back from the procedure, you will maintain them NPO until the gag reflex returns. This is again because something has been sprayed into their throat which numbs the area. And we will not give PO fluids or fluids by mouth until we are sure that they have an active gag reflex. You will check for vomiting of blood and any respiratory distress. And the patient should know ahead of time and be reminded after the test that it is not unusual for them to have a sore throat for three to four days after the procedure. 
Okay, let's go a little bit lower on down in the body now, and we're going to talk about a sigmoidoscopy. Remember, sigmoidoscopy is visualization of the sigmoid colon, rectum, and the anal canal. Let's talk about how to get somebody ready for a sigmoidoscopy. To prepare them, they will receive a laxative the night before the exam. They will receive enemas or a suppository the morning of the exam. And they will be NPO at midnight, again the night before the test is to be done. After the test, the client should be allowed to rest. This is kind of an arduous um, test that they undergo. So they need to be allowed to rest. You will monitor the client for hemorrhage because one of the complications after a sigmoidoscopy is perforation of the intestines and resultant hemorrhaging. So you want to monitor vital signs and again check for hemorrhaging. And you want to encourage fluids. Now the reason you encourage fluids is, remember how we got them ready. They had laxatives the night before, they had um, enemas or suppositories the morning of, and they were NPO. These patients will undergo or have fluid volume deficit unless we address the issue. So you want to force fluids afterward, again, once they are alert and oriented. Let's talk about a similar type test, and this is a colonoscopy. A colonoscopy is direct visualization of the colon. To get somebody ready, they will be on a clear liquid diet 24 to 72 hours before the test. They will receive a cathartic or a laxative in the evening or every evening for two days prior to the test. And they will receive an enema the morning of the exam. The reason for all this bowel prep is they need to be able to see. And if there is fecal contents in the area, they will be unable to see any abnormal cells or abnormal areas. So that's the reason for the bowel prep. After the test, it's again similar to what we talked about with the sigmoidoscopy. You allow the patient to rest. You will check for hemorrhage or any respiratory distress because again, perforation of the bowel could occur. They may do follow-up x-rays and you will resume the client's diet. Again, encouraging fluids because of the arduous bowel routine that was done in preparation for this procedure. Let's talk about another diagnostic test and this is a gastric aspirate. This is where they aspirate the gastric contents and take a look at them. To prepare someone for a gastric aspirate, first of all, they will be NPO. They will aspirate stomach contents using an NG tube. Sometimes they will administer histamine before the test is started because this stimulates the secretion of the stomach contents. And then the specimen they obtain can be checked for blood and the pH can be measured. After a gastric aspirate, you want to encourage fluids. Again, they've been NPO for a period of time. You want to make sure that they have adequate hydration. Let's talk about an upper GI series, also known as a barium swallow. The type of procedure they do for this where they're looking at the upper part of the GI tract is the patient will be NPO after midnight. And they need to know that their stool will be light colored after the procedure because it is exactly what it sounds like. They will swallow barium, and the barium will turn their, their stool light. We want that to happen because we don't want the barium to stay there because it could cause a fecal impaction. After the test, again, you want to encourage fluids. We give the patient, or the patient many times will be given laxatives to prevent constipation. Again, if the barium stays in the bowel, it will turn to kind of a concrete-like substance, and that could cause a serious fecal impaction. And again, the patient should be told that their stool will be white after the procedure. Otherwise, they'll come running out of the bathroom saying, something's wrong with me, my stool is now white. Again, let's let them know going in what to expect. Let's talk about another diagnostic test involving the GI tract. This is a barium enema or a lower GI series. Let's talk about the preparation. To prepare someone for a barium enema or a lower GI series, they will receive liquid diet and laxatives the night before the exam. They will receive enemas the morning of the exam. After the test, again, we need to let them rest. They will receive cleansing enemas to remove the barium. Again, if the barium is left in place, it will or can result in constipation and a fecal impaction. And they may do x-rays after the test is done and after all the barium is expelled. Let's talk about a different type of diagnostic test. This again is one frequently done and it's known as a paracentesis. 
What you need to know for a paracentesis is preparation, how to get somebody ready, how the procedure is done, the care after the procedure, and what complications are you trying to prevent, and how would you know if the patient was experiencing them. Remember, with paracentesis, this is a needle aspiration of fluid from the abdominal cavity. Okay, let's talk about how to get somebody ready. To get somebody ready for a paracentesis, you will position them in the semi-fowler's position, the 30 to 45 degree angle elevation of the head of the bed. Or they may be sitting upright on the edge of the bed. They should empty their bladder before the procedure. After the paracentesis where the fluid is removed from the abdominal cavity, you will check vital signs. What you're looking for is hypotension because of the shift in fluids because fluids have been removed from the cavity. You want to report any fever or abdominal pain. These indicate complications. Complications could be infection. Complications could be fluid dynamic shifts. Could be hemorrhage. And you want to observe for shock. Okay, let's talk about another diagnostic test. This is a lapar laparoscopy. Laparoscopy is where they visualize the pelvic cavity. Let's talk about how to get somebody ready for a laparoscopy. Many times, or most of the time, general anesthesia is used, and a Foley catheter is inserted before the procedure. What they do is they introduce carbon dioxide into the area, into the pelvic cavity, to kind of separate things so they can go in with a lighted instrument and look around. After the procedure, the client will be out of bed as soon as they are awake and alert, they've recovered from the general anesthesia, and then they can resume their general diet. Okay, let's go on to another diagnostic test. This is a cystoscopy. Remember, cystoscopy is where the, they visualize the bladder. Let's talk about how to get somebody ready. If the patient is going to have a cystoscopy, they do a bowel preparation, the enemas and laxatives that we've talked about before. They force fluids. Again, they need to make sure the patient remains hydrated and they want fluid in the area. If the patient is to be sedated during the cystoscopy, they will be made NPO. After the cystoscopy, where they actually go in and look at the bladder with a lighted instrument, you will monitor the character and volume of the urine for the patient. You're looking for abdominal distension, any urinary frequency or fever. Because again, you might guess what one of the complications is for a cystoscopy. Yes, infection. And infection will be shown by urinary frequency and fever. It's not unusual for the urine after a cystoscopy to be pink tinged. It should not be bright red. If it were bright red, that tells you that the bladder has been perforated, and that is a complication, should be investigated and immediately reported. And again, they may use antimicrobial prophylaxis. What that means is they may put the patient on antibiotics to, because this is an invasive procedure, to prevent the development of infection. Let's talk about an intravenous pylorogram, or IVP. Frequently tested topic on the NCLEX. The type of questions will revolve around preparation for the procedure, the procedure itself, how it's done, care after the procedure, and complications the patient may experience. Let's talk about an IVP. Remember, IVP is where they visualize the kidney, ureter, and bladder. Let's get somebody ready for an IVP. Again, they will do a bowel preparation, the laxatives and enemas we talked about before. The patient will be NPO after midnight, and because dye is used with an IVP, it's critically important that you check the patient for allergies. You need to let them know that they may experience a burning or a salty taste when the dye is injected, and they need to know that they, their x-rays will be taken at intervals. Let's talk a little bit about a renal biopsy, getting somebody ready for a renal biopsy. To get somebody ready for a renal biopsy, you need to let them know about the test or the procedure, how it will be accomplished. They need to know that x-rays will be taken. They want to identify where the kidney is because they go in at a certain place that's less vascular. So the skin is marked at the lower pole of the kidney because that's where they will actually go in to do the biopsy. Again, the kidney is a highly vascular organ. The patient for the procedure will be positioned prone and bent at the diaphragm, and they will be asked to hold their breath when the needle is inserted. 
So again, they need to know all of this before they actually go to the procedure. What happens after the procedure? When they come back to the room or immediately after the procedure, pressure will be applied to the site for 20 minutes. Again, the kidney is a highly vascular procedure, and one of the complications after a renal biopsy is hemorrhage. The after pressure is applied for 20 minutes, they will actually apply a pressure dressing. The patient will remain flat in bed, on bed rest for 24 hours. Again, we don't want them up and moving around. And you will check for hematuria and bleeding at the site. Again, the complication you're looking for and trying to prevent with the bed rest is hemorrhage. Let's take a look at another test, and this is the Schilling's test. Schilling's test diagnoses vitamin B, vitamin B12 deficiency or pernicious anemia. Let's take a look at the preparation for a Schilling's test. The client needs to know how it is performed. What they do is they will give the client radioactive vitamin B12, and then they will look at the amount excreted. Now, a normal person, that is someone who doesn't have pernicious anemia, will excrete um, a certain, they will excrete more than 10% of the radioactive vitamin B12 within the first 24 hours. Let's talk about after the test. If the patient has pernicious anemia, they will excrete less than 10% of the dye or I'm sorry, of the radioactive B12 after the procedure. The reason they don't excrete much of it is they use it because they need it. And if a patient has pernicious anemia, they will need to take vitamin B12 injections for the rest of their life. That is cyanocobalamin injections for the rest of their life. Okay, that kind of concludes our discussion of diagnostic procedures. Let's now begin talking about therapeutic procedures. With therapeutic procedures, the type of questions that will be seen on the NCLEX is how to get somebody ready for a procedure and how to care for them after the procedure has been done. There also may be questions that deal with actually how the therapeutic procedures are performed. And again, how to prevent complications from therapeutic procedures. Let's talk first about, and the first one's an easy one, breathing exercises. The type of breathing exercises clients should be taught, first of, all, first of all, are diaphragmatic or abdominal breathing. To accomplish this, the patient is positioned on their back with their knees bent and their hands on their abdomen. And they're told to breathe in and out so that their hands move. Again, they're on their back with their knees bent, hands on the abdomen, and they're told to breathe in and out and make sure their hands move with every inspiration and expiration. This is diaphragmatic or abdominal breathing. Try it. Okay, the second type of breathing exercise is pursed lip breathing. What they do to accomplish this is you breathe in through your nose, purse your lips, kind of make a sucking or kissing movement, and then breathe out through the mouth. So it's a type of activity. You may remember that we talked about this when we talked about patients that have COPD. Let's talk about another type of therapeutic procedure, and this is coughing techniques. It's imperative that we teach patients after surgery, or really we need to teach them before surgery, how to cough effectively after surgery. To do effective coughing, the client should take three slow and deep breaths, exhaling very slowly. Then they take a fourth breath and cough several times during expiration. And they should cough from deep within their chest. This makes an effective cough. If they're just doing these little <coughs> coughs, those are not effective, and it will not expectorate or remove secretions. Let's talk about another therapeutic procedure, which is postural drainage. Postural drainage, you'll remember, uses gravity to facilitate drainage. What they do, or what you do with postural drainage, is you pay, place the client in positions to facilitate drainage of secretions into the larger airways. Then the secretions can be removed either by coughing or by suctioning. Something that's many times done in addition to or along with postural drainage is called percussion and vibration. You'll remember that percussion is the rhythmic striking of the chest wall with cupped hands. And it's usually performed over the area where the secretions are. So it's kind of a horse type of hoof type of sound. Again, over the area where the actual consolidation is. Vibration, on the other hand, is a vibrating pressure 
applied to the chest as the person exhales. So you would place your hands over the area of consolidation, and as they exhale, you would vibrate. This would help break apart the secretions. Let's talk about suctioning. Again, this helps the patient expectorate or remove the secretions that have pooled. One of the key issues that you need to know with regard to suctioning is you need to hyperoxygenate the client before, during, and after the suctioning. This may be turning up the level of the oxygen that they are getting. It may be having them take a couple of deep breaths. What we don't want to do is suctioning does take out secretions and all that, but it also takes out available oxygen. And we don't want to make our client hypoxic because we have suctioned out, in addition to their secretions, all their available oxygen. The best position to have the patient in when you're doing suctioning is semi-fowlers. Remember, this is the 30 to 45 degree angle. You will lubricate the catheter with sterile saline. You will advance it not applying suction. You will apply suction only for 10 to 15 seconds at a time and only as the catheter is withdrawn. If the patient has an endotracheal tube or a tracheostomy tube, you will suction the endotracheal tube or the tracheostomy tube first and then the patient's mouth. Let's talk about tracheostomy care. First of all, again, we talked about the need to hyperoxygenate the patient before you do any suctioning. So you want to hyperoxygenate them or have them take several slow, deep breaths. Then you will suction the tracheostomy tube. You will then remove the old dressing. And during this time, you have clean gloves on, not sterile gloves. You will discard it appropriately. You will then open the sterile kit, again, using sterile technique. At that point in time, you will put on the sterile gloves that are found in the kit. You will then remove the inner cannula. And let me demonstrate how that that takes place. Inner cannula is then removed because we're going to clean it separately from the outer cannula. Let's talk about what to do and how to clean the cannula. You will clean the inner cannula using hydrogen peroxide. You will rinse it with sterile water and then you will dry it. And it's very important to dry it with a non-lint type of uh, drying material so you don't get lint on it. So this will be cleaned. And again, the kit you get has all the equipment. There's a little brush to make sure all the secretions get off of it. You'll use the um, sterile saline, the sterile water to to rinse it, and there will be something in there to dry it because this has to be done using sterile technique. The next thing you'll do is you will then reinsert the inner cannula into the outer cannula, like so. Again, put it back into place. Then you will clean the stomacite using hydrogen peroxide. You will rinse the stomacite with water and then dry it. Again, remember the stomacite is around the area of the trach. So again, you want to make good clean area here. And kind of an aside here, when you're standing in front of a patient with a trach, always stand to the side in case they cough or something, you'd want to be in the area of whatever projectile comes out of the trach. You want to then change the ties. Now the ties are the strings that hold the trach in place. Key point, it's also frequently tested and it's also very important, you keep the old ties in place until the new ties are in position. Because if you don't, if you take out the ties and they're gone, when you turn around to put the ties back on, Many times the patient will have extubated or coughed out their trach. So you keep the ties in place until the old ties in place until the new ties are secured. Okay, you then will apply a sterile dressing and it's imperative that you not take a sterile 4x4 and cut it. The reason for this is there would then be pieces of the fiber that you cut and they could be aspirated into the trach. Again, you will get a pre-cut gauze where all the edges are bound together so there's no chance of getting lint into the tracheostomy. Okay, let's take a look at and talk about the cuff of the trach tube. Now the cuff of the trach tube is in place to prevent the aspiration of fluids. And what I'm talking about is the part at the bottom of the trach. This is inflated and there's a little kind of like pilot um, gauge here and a syringe is used to inflate the cuff, like so. 
Now, it's important for you to know when the cuff should be inflated and when it should be deflated. Again, a frequently tested topic on the NCLEX. The cuff should be inflated during continuous mechanical ventilation. It should be inflated during and after eating. It should be inflated during and one hour after a tube feeding. And it should be inflated when the patient cannot handle oral secretions. Now, what's important to remember is the purpose of the cuff is to separate the upper and lower airways. This prevents any type of fluid or secretion from getting down into the lung area. So the purpose of the cuff is not to hold the trach in place, but to, again, separate upper and lower airways to make sure that no aspiration takes place. Okay, let's go on. We've talked about trachs. Let's now talk about oxygen administration. Oxygen administration can be given many different ways. And the first way we're going to talk about is using nasal cannula or nasal prongs. This probably is the most frequent way you'll see patients receiving oxygen. The type of nursing care involved in this is you need to assess the patency of the patient's nostril. If they have an a uh, deviated septum and they cannot breathe in one side, they're only getting a small amount of the oxygen that's being delivered with the nasal cannula or the nasal prongs. Also, if any secretions get on the prongs and it occludes the opening, they're not getting the oxygen that should be delivered to them. You want to apply water-soluble jelly every three to four hours. Again, this helps prevent any crusting or irritation to the nostril. But be careful. Remember, not Vaseline. It has to be a water-soluble jelly. And while the patient is receiving oxygen, it's essential to give them good mouth care because at times this can be very drying. Another way of receiving oxygen is using a face mask. These, I'm sure you're familiar with, you've seen patients. They cover the nose and the mouth area. These should be removed every one to two hours. They should be washed. They should be dried, as should the skin underneath the mask and you should apply lotion to the skin. Again, the oxygen flow should be a minimum of five liters per minute for a patient receiving oxygen with a face mask. The only caveat to this is that should not be done if the patient has COPD. And we talked about the reason for giving low flow O2 to clients with COPD. Another type of way oxygen is administered is what, what they call a partial rebreather mask. What you need to do here is adjust the flow to keep the reservoir bag about two-thirds full during inspiration. There's also a non-rebreather mask, and what the nursing responsibility is here is to adjust the flow to keep the reservoir bag two-thirds full during inspiration. So for both of these, the nursing responsibility is the same. Another way that oxygen can be administered is using a Venturi mask. This provides high humidity and a fixed concentration of oxygen. So if it's critically important that the physician know exactly how much oxygen is being administered to the patient, many times this type of equipment will be used. And again, one of the nursing responsibilities with the Venturi mask is to keep the tubing free of any kinks. Another way of administering oxygen is with a tracheostomy collar or a T-piece. What you need to do in this case is to assess for a fine mist. Make sure that the, the area is patent and open. You need to empty any condensation from the tubing. Because remember, if you're giving a patient oxygen with a tracheostomy collar, the oxygen has to be humidified, which means there will be condensation in the tubing. You and I use our nose to humidify the oxygen we breathe in. Because, again, that's one of the reasons for your nose besides having a place to put your glasses. But a patient that's receiving oxygen through a trach doesn't have an ability to humidify the oxygen. So this needs to be provided for the patient. But we need to make sure that condensation, condensation which can collect in the tubing, is emptied. And we need to make sure and keep the water container full. Because, again, the oxygen has to be humidified before it's delivered to the patient. Otherwise, it totally dries out the mucous membranes. Let's talk about another way that oxygen can be administered, and that's using a croupette or an oxygen tent. Using this type of equipment, it's difficult to measure the exact amount of oxygen that's being delivered. But an oxygen tent or a croupette provides cooled, humidified air. 
You may remember that we talked about this when we talked about a child with croup or acute epiglottitis. This, again, the cool humidified air, you need to check the oxygen concentration with an oxygen analyzer every four hours. Because again, remember, it's difficult to know exactly the amount of oxygen that's being delivered to the client. You will clean the humidity jar and refill it with sterile distilled water daily. Again, you need to, this, in this situation, the oxygen is being administered along with humidity. Okay, uh, the oxygenet or the croupet oxygen tent, other things that you need to do are to make sure the patient is covered with a light blanket and frequently they will put a cap on the patient's head. Again, usually this is a child. You will make sure the side rails are raised completely. Because there are sides to this, sometimes the nurse forgets that the side of the tent, which is a plastic apparatus, does not prevent the child or the infant from rolling or getting out of bed. So again, the side rails need to be up all the time in the raised position for safety. Because this is a very humid environment, the bed linen needs to be changed very frequently, and you'll need to monitor the patient's temperature. Now, oxygen is a very good thing, but there are some hazards associated with its use. And let's talk about the hazards of oxygen administration. First of all, there's a chance of infection, and it really comes from the equipment itself. We need to make sure and change the masks, change the tubing, change the mouthpiece, and make sure and keep them in a clean situation or state. Another hazard of oxygen administration is drying of the mucosa. We talked a little bit about this. Whenever oxygen is used, or most of the time when oxygen is used, it needs to be humidified. Because again, remember, you and I use our nose, the, you know, the fibers in our nose, to humidify the oxygen that we breathe in. Another hazard of oxygen administration is respiratory depression. This, again, some patients are especially susceptible to this. For example, COPD patients are especially susceptible to oxygen or respiratory depression. What you would do for a patient that is experiencing respiratory depression due to oxygen administration, you would alternate between room air and oxygen. Or you administer oxygen already mixed with room air. And you want to make sure that the oxygen administered is the minimal amount that will get the maximum benefit. You don't want to give any higher flow leaders more than you need to to accomplish good ventilatory effort and, and good ABGs for your patients. There's other oxygen um, hazards that we want to look at. First one is oxygen toxicity. Low concentration oxygen is given to infants to prevent Retinopathy of prematurity, ROP. We talked about that earlier. Again, remember this can be a cause of blindness. It causes the pupil to constrict and then will cause blindness in, in an infant. Respirators may cause pulmonary damage. Again, they should be used cautiously and there should be good nursing care for the patients who are receiving ventilatory assistance. The type of symptoms you will see with oxygen toxic toxicity are the patient may cough, there may be nasal congestion. The patient may complain of a sore throat. They may have a reduced vital capacity, and they may experience substernal discomfort. What you will do, or another hazard of oxygen administration. Combustion is an issue. Oxygen is very combustible. All equipment should be grounded, and no smoking should be allowed. That kind of concludes our discussion about oxygen therapy. Let's now talk about chest tubes. And when we talk about chest tubes, we talk about a pleurovac, which is a water seal type of drainage system. What we will do to care for chest tubes, first of all, the water seal chamber should be filled with sterile water up to the two centimeter mark. And remember the water seal chamber is the middle chamber of the three chambers of the pleurovac. The second thing you need to do with a chest tube is to fill the suction control chamber with sterile water, and it's usually filled to the 20 centimeter mark or as ordered by the physician. And the suction control chamber is the chamber all the way um, to the right. Again, this, this controls or alters the amount of suction that is applied to the patient. The second chamber, make sure this is a one-way valve that only things can be sucked out, if you will, from the lung and not put back in. 
And the third chamber is where the air and fluid from the pleural space comes to. That's the collection chamber. So what we want to do is this whole system must be maintained below the level of insertion. So for example, if I had a chest tube, this would be way too high. The level of insertion would be here, and the apparatus should be below the level of insertion. Remember, fluids love to run downhill, and we don't want to give them that opportunity. The chest tube should be clamped only momentarily if you are checking for air leaks. And you will know a client has an air leak if there is continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber. That will indicate an air leak. Only then would you clamp the tubing to check for an air leak. And again, you clamp it just momentarily. If this becomes full, the, the collection chamber, you would clamp it and then get a new Pluravac, put it in place. Let's, again, Pluravac, um, the three chambers, you need to know what each chamber is responsible for. You need to know how to get each chamber ready for a patient. And you need to know how to maintain the equipment while the patient is receiving it. Okay. Let's talk about other things with regard to chest tubes. What you will see if the chest tubes are operating as they should be. There will be fluctuation or tidling of water in the, or of the fluid in the water seal chamber. Again, remember, the water seal chamber is the middle chamber. This should fluctuate or tidal with respirations. If it doesn't, one of two things has happened. Either the lung has re-expanded, which is a good thing, or... The, there is a block or a, a, a leak in the area. It's, you know, there's a problem with it. And then you need to know to investigate that. What you will do is, if the tube becomes blocked, you will gently milk the tube in the direction of the drainage. This should get rid of any occlusion you have in the system. And patients that have chest tubes in place should be encouraged to change positions frequently. Not only that, but they do not need to be on bed rest. Many times having them move about in bed gets the lung to re-expand more quickly and is a positive thing for the patient to do. When the chest tube is ready to be removed, sometimes the physician will say, leave it in place but disconnect it from suction. Just leave it open to air. You can do that, not a problem. When the physician actually goes to remove the chest tube, he will or she will instruct the patient to do the Valsava maneuver. Remember, that's the forcible exhalation against a closed glottis. You kind of hold your breath and bear down. The chest tube will be clamped, the tube will be removed quickly, and then an occlusive dressing will be applied to the site. This is to prevent any air from going back into the opening. Complications of chest tubes. The type of things that you are looking for, first of all, there'll be a complication if there is continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber. Remember, that's the middle chamber. That would indicate an air leak. Another complication would be if the tube becomes dislodged from the patient. That's the tube that goes into the patient. If this happens, you apply, this has come out of the patient, you apply a tented dressing or a dressing that is tented on one side to the area of insertion on the patient. Well, let's say that the tube didn't come out of the patient, but the tube came out of the Pluravac. In this case, it came out of the drainage system. You would cut off the contaminated tip, insert, it in, insert a sterile connector and reinsert it, or you can immerse it in two centimeters of sterile water, get a new Pluravac, and then put it back together. Okay, that concludes our discussion of chest tubes. Let's now talk about a central venous pressure. Central venous pressure is something that indicates or measures the amount of fluid that is returned to the right atrium. Let's take a look at the type of things you'll do to measure a CVP. First of all, the zero on the manometer needs to be at the level of the right atrium at the mid-axillary line. If you do not do this, if the position of the patient is not this, when you take the reading, the reading will be inaccurate. Again, you measure with the patient flat in bed, zero of the manometer at the level of the right atrium at the mid-axillary line. You will open the stopcock and fill the manometer to a level of 18 to 20 centimeters. 
You will then turn the stopcock and allow the fluid to flow into the patient. You will note that the level of fluid fluctuates with respirations. You will measure the CVP at the highest level of fluctuation. The results of a CP, what you would expect to see, normal reading is 3 to 11 centimeters of water. Yes, centimeters of water. A CVP that's elevated, which means greater than 11, indicates that the client is hypervolemic, or that is, has too much fluid, or there is poor cardiac contractility, meaning the heart is failing, it's not squeezing effectively, and the cardiac output has fallen. A low CVP, on the other hand, that is, one below three, tells you that the client is hypovolemic. Now, a frequent test question on the NCLEX is they give you a CVP reading, and they ask you what you would expect the physician to order or to do. So again, if the CVP reading comes back low, meaning you know two, three, four, you would expect the physician to speed up or increase the IV flow rate. If the CVP reading comes back high, that's 9, 10, or 11, you would expect the physician to decrease the IV flow rate. If it comes back within normal, like 5 or 6, you would expect the physician to keep things as they are. Now, a couple of complications you need to know about for a CVP. First of all, pneumothorax can occur. Air embolism can occur, and infection is a possibility because this is an invasive procedure. Let's talk about how to care for a CVP. First of all, you should apply a dry, sterile dressing over the site of insertion. This dressing will be changed every 24 hours in addition to the IV fluids, the manometer, and the tubing. When the catheter is, or the tubing is changed, again, when the tubing is changed, you will tell the client, instruct them to hold their breath when the tubing is inserted or withdrawn or when the tubing is changed. You will check and secure all connections with tape so there is no leakage. Okay, that concludes our discussion about a CVP. Let's go on to some less invasive type of therapeutic procedures. Let's talk about how you would perform an ear irrigation. First of all, you would tilt the patient's head toward the side of the affected ear. If you're going to irrigate the right ear, the head would be tilted to the right side. You would gently direct a stream of fluid against the side of the ear. Remember, it's critically important that you not do this straight in. It would put pressure against the eardrum that could cause injury. After the irrigation has been concluded, the client will lay on the affected side. This is to allow for drainage. And ear irrigations are contraindicated if there's any swelling or tenderness of the ear area. Let's talk about ear drops, how you would apply ear drops. To instill ear drops, you pull the outer ear upward and backward for an adult. You pull it downward and backward for a child. Now, this again is something that's frequently tested on the NCLEX, and the way I remember the different way to pull the ear is an adult is much taller than a child. So I pull the ear up and back because he's tall. For a child, they're short. I pull the ear down and back. Again, that's my clue or my um, easy way of remembering the difference. To instill eardrops, you would put the drop in and allow it to run down the side of the canal. You do not place it dead center into the ear because it will then bounce off the eardrum and that would cause pain. And the patient after eardrops should lie on the unaffected side. Again, remember it makes sense because of gravity. If I put eardrops into my right ear and I lay on my left side, the eardrop will stay against my membrane here. But if I put them in my right ear and then I lay on my right side, all of that I put in there will drain out. Let's talk about how to perform an eye irrigation. To do an eye irrigation, you will tilt the client's head back and toward the affected side. So let's just say I'm going to irrigate my right eye. My head should be tilted back and to the right side. What you do with an eye irrigation is you allow fluid to flow from the inner canthus to the outer canthus. So again, on my right side, it would start with my inner canthus and would flow outward toward my outer canthus. And a small bulb syringe or eyedropper is used. You don't want to apply a lot of pressure. Let's talk about how to instill eye drops. Again, frequently tested topic, common area of teaching we do with clients. We talked before about glaucoma clients and 
cataract clients and many times eye drops are instilled. What the client should do is to tilt their head back and the client should look up. You or the client will pull the lower lid down. What you want to do is expose the bulbar conjunctiva, which is the lining of the lower part of the eye. You will place the eye drops into the lower conjunctival sac. The client should blink between drops. Now notice I said blink, not squeeze their eye shut. Because if they squeeze their eye shut, that would cause the eye drop to be squeezed out. But they should blink between drops. And if you want to prevent systemic absorption, you would press on the inner angle of the eye. That is, you would press on the inner canthus. That prevents the body from systemically absorbing the medication in the eye drops. A couple of other things with regard to eye drops. Do not touch the dropper to the eye. Even if this is one person's eye drops and they use them all the time, it contaminates the eye drop and it may injure the eye. You should not allow eye drops from one eye to go into the opposite eye. So it may be handy to have a Kleenex there to catch things that are trying to escape and get to the other eye. And the client should be told not to squeeze their eye between drops. They should gently close their eye or blink. If they squeeze their eye shut again, the eye drop may be expelled. Okay, we're going to go from eyes and ears, and now we're going to talk a little, bit, a little bit about nasogastric tubes, the type of things you need to know for the NCLEX. For the NCLEX, you need to know about the different types of tubes. You need to know how to care for the tubes. You need to know how to insert an NG tube and how to remove it. Let's talk about the different NG tubes. The first type of NG tube that is used is a Levine tube. You'll remember this, or 11, depends on the part of country where you learned how to say this word. I say Levine tube. It's a single lumen tube. It is used for decompression or for tube feeding. The second type of tube that is used is called a Salem sump. A Salem sump tube is a double lumen tube. It also is used for decompression or tube feeding, but it has what we call a pigtail. And the pigtails usually are colored differently than the regular tube. The reason for the pigtail is this allows the second lumen in here, air to be freely exchanged between the outside and the stomach. So if suction is applied to the tube, the end of it doesn't get up against the mucosa wall and then suck the mucosa into the tubes here. So it allows for free exchange of air. This is a much more comfortable tube, if you will, for patients that have nasogastric tubes. A couple of things. You may see it done, but it is totally inappropriate to clamp off the pigtail. If you do that, you have now just changed your Salem sump tube into a Levine tube. It now is a single lumen tube because you have clamped off the pigtail. Now the pigtail may leak if it is down below the level of insertion. So if I had this NG tube in place, you should keep this above the level of insertion on the pillow. That way it cannot um, back up in the, in the area. If fluid gets into your pigtail, you can irrigate it with air. Again, the pigtail is not the device used to irrigate nasogastric tubes unless you are irrigating them with air. That's all that goes into a pigtail. That was the Salem sump tube. Let's, let's take a look at the next type of nasogastric tube. This is one that we've talked about a little bit earlier in this presentation, and that's the Sense-Taken Blakemore tube. Remember, it's a triple lumen tube used to treat bleeding esophageal varices. Another type of nasogastric tube is the Linton notchless tube. This is a four lumen tube used also for bleeding esophageal varices. Continuing with nasogastric tubes, the next type of tube is the Keofeed Dubhoff tube. This is a soft silicone tube used for long-term feedings. And this is what it looks like. Again, there are a couple of ports here. There is a stylus used to insert the tube, and you can see that it's a very soft type of tube, again, used for long-term feedings. Another type of tube is a canter tube. This is a single lumen tube used, or it's filled with mercury at the end. There's a balloon, and there's a suction port, and this is used many times to treat intestinal obstructions. Another type of tube that's similar to the canter tube is the Miller-Abbott tube. This is a double lumen tube again with a mercury-filled balloon and a suction port. And another type of tube is a Harris tube. A Harris tube is a single lumen tube also with a mercury-filled balloon and a suction port. 
Now, let's talk about how you would insert a Levine or a Salem sump tube. With the Levine or Salem sump tube, the first thing you want to do is measure to make sure that you know how you're going to put it in. And what you do to measure is you measure from the tip of the nose to the earlobe to the bottom of the xiphoid process. And you will use the tube to do this. So, I will start with the end of the tube, nose to earlobe to the bottom of the xiphoid process. And then I will mark this location with a piece of tape. Now, there are little lines on the tube. can't see them, but they're there. Um, but it, the best idea is to actually put a piece of tape there. Then I know that this amount of tube needs to be introduced to the patient. Okay, you will mark the distance on the tube. You will lubricate the end of the tube using water-soluble jelly. Again, it has to be water-soluble. cannot be Vaseline because we want to have ease of insertion of inserting the tube. Once it's measured and lubricated, the tube is inserted through the nose into the stomach. And to do this, it helps if the client bends their head slightly forward. And while this is going on, you want to observe for respiratory distress. If the client can suck on ice chips, sometimes it's helpful if they do that, and then as the client swallows, you advance the tube. However, some clients are either comatose or NPO, and they're not allowed to suck on the ice chips. To check the placement for the Levine or the Salem sump, what you do, there are several ways of doing it. You can inject 15 cc's of air into the stomach while listening over the epigastric area. This is the common way that the tube placement has been, has been checked in the past. However, recent literature suggests that this is not always an accurate way of checking for placement. The more accurate way to check for placement is to aspirate stomach contents and check the pH. These tubes are also radiolucent, and when in doubt, an x-ray can be performed and actually see where the tube is. You would never initiate a feeding without checking for placement of the tube. And each time a feeding is performed, the placement of the tube is checked. Let's talk about care of a Levine or a Salem sump. What we will do is we will check residual before we do intermittent feedings, and if the patient is receiving continuous feedings, we will check for residual every four hours. And remember, the residual is always reinserted. Now, you need to make a decision whether or not you're going to hold the next feeding. You will hold the next feeding if the residual you obtain is 50% of what was administered the previous hour. This is for adults. So if I get a residual back of 50 cc's, and the previous hour I gave the patient 100 cc's, that is 50% of what I gave them the previous hour, I would hold the feeding. With children, if the residual you obtain is 25% of the amount that you administered the previous hour, that feeding will be held. What you want to do is you don't want to keep instilling feeding such that the stomach becomes distended and then there's the danger of vomiting and aspiration. What you'll do when giving tube feedings is you will flush the tube with water before and after each feeding. Two reasons this is done. One is it provides what we call free water to the client. The type of tube feedings we administer are very hypertonic, so clients need free water to make sure they remain hydrated. The second re reason we flush with water is to maintain the patency of the tube. And most of our tube feedings are no longer done to gravity, using the funnel like we did in the good old days, but a pump is usually used to control the rate of the tube feeding to make sure that it goes at, a, at the right rate. Other things with the Levine tube, you want to make sure the fluid is administered at room temperature. Many times these fluids and, and IV or tube feedings are kept in the refrigerator, but it should be warm to room temperature before it's administered to the client. Otherwise, the client will experience cramping and abdominal pain. You need to change the bag every eight hours if the patient is getting a continuous feeding. Again, bacteria and the chance of infection increases if, IV, or if uh, tube feeding bags hang longer than eight hours. While the patient is receiving a tube feeding, it is critically important that the head of the bed be elevated. This is to prevent the danger of aspiration. If for some reason the client would vomit, they can turn their head to the side and they will not aspirate the fluid. If they are laying flat in bed, the danger of aspiration is high. You will check patency every four hours. Any client receiving 
tube feedings will be on intake and output, and you need to make sure and give good mouth care. Let's talk about how you would irrigate a Levine or a Salem sump. First of all, before you do anything, as we said before, you verify the placement of the tube. Best way to do that is to aspirate the stomach contents and check the pH. You would then insert 30 to 50 cc's of normal saline into the tube. Note we're using normal saline. It's an isotonic solution. We want to make sure and not put this person into fluid and electrolyte problems. If you feel resistance, change the patient's position and check the tube for kinks. You would never push against resistance. Once the irrigation has been done, you will either withdraw the solution back up through the tube or record the amount as input. When a Salem sump or a Levine tube is going to be removed, the way this takes place is, first of all, the tube is clamped. The tape is removed that's holding it in place. You will instruct the client to exhale, and you will remove the tube with a smooth, continuous pull. And it's very helpful to have a towel or something there. As you pull it out, it goes into this towel and then wrapped up and quickly taken away. It's not exactly what you want the patient looking at after it's been in place for some time. Let's talk about the type of care you will give for intestinal tubes. These are tubes such as the Cantor tube, the Miller-Abbott tube, and the Harris tube. After the tube is in the stomach, you will have the patient lie first on the right side, then on the back in Fowler's position, and then on the left side. Remember, these type of tubes have a ball or a balloon of mercury, and they are used to snake their way through the GI tract. So again, we're going to position the patient to encourage that tube to go through the GI tract. So again, you have them lie on their right side, then on their back in Fowler's position, and then on their left side, because gravity will help to position the tube. The excess tube should not be taped. It should be coiled loosely onto the bed, because as the tube gets advanced through the GI tract, there will be less and less on the bed. If you tape the tube in place, you will stop the advancement of the tube, which is what is supposed to be occurring. The position of the tube is verified by x-ray because it is, it is radio-opaque, and you will measure the drainage of the tube every shift. And again, you need to monitor and make sure that it is advancing as it should be. And you want to report any signs of peristalsis. Remember, intestinal tubes are used when there is an obstruction or there's paralytic ileus to kind of get things moving again. Now, when intestinal tubes are removed, you will clamp the tube, you will remove the tape, you will deflate the balloon or aspirate the contents of the intestinal balloon. We're not going to pull it out with that balloon inflated and in place. When everything has been aspirated and deflated, you will then instruct the client to exhale, and you will remove six inches every 10 minutes until it reaches the stomach. Then you will do what you did with the Levine or Salem sump. You will completely remove the tube with a smooth, continuous pull. So this is a little different removing an intestinal tube from removing the type of tube, the Levine and Salem sump, that only go to the stomach. We're going to change course a little bit here, and we're going to talk about surgical drains. With surgical drains, first of all, we're going to talk about the easiest or the most common type of surgical drain, and that's a Penrose drain. With a Penrose drain, you'll note the location, and if a Penrose drain has been placed, you will expect drainage on the dressing. Now, this is a Penrose drain. You can see it's a very simple rubber tubing. It is placed into an incision so that fluid can come out. Because, again, if we get fluid out of the incision, healing can take place. This facilitates healing. And, again, if a tube has been placed, a drain, you would expect more drainage than if a tube or a drain was not placed. Another type of surgical drain is a T-tube, and we talked about this when we talked about gallbladder problems. Initially, you would expect 500 to 1,000 cc's per day. It will be bloody the first two hours, and as time goes on, the amount that comes into the T-tube will decrease. And again, it's very important to keep the drainage bag on the bed. It should not be higher than the level of insertion. Fluids love to run downhill. Let's talk about another type of tube. This is a Jackson Pratt. A Jackson Pratt is a type of self-suction device. What you will do is monitor the amount and character of the drainage. 
and you will notify the physician if the amount of drainage increases suddenly or becomes bright red. This is a Jackson Pratt. Again, you'll see it's a self-suction device. It is squeezed together, and then you can hear the suction that is applied to here. So again, Jackson Pratt is kind of like a little hand grenade, if you will, type of self-suction device. Let's talk about another type of self-suction device that is similar to a Jackson Pratt. This is a Hemovac. Now this looks like a small round accordion. It has pleats in it. Um, again, a self-suction device. What you want to do here is you remove the plug to empty the contents. You place it on a flat surface and compress it completely. To remove all the air, you replace the plug, and then you're set to go again. So again, the Jackson Pratt, again, similar type of, of things. You will empty the bottom to drain out the drainage. You will completely compress it, put the plug back in place, and you're set again to um, go back and have the patient. And again, the small amount of suction will remove excess secretions from the incision. Let's take a look at something entirely different. We're going to now talk about administration of an enema. This is something you probably had way back in your fundamental days. But it's essential that you remember this and review it because you may see questions on the exam concerning it. First of all, you want to position the patient on their left side. There is an anatomical reason to do this because the opening into the GI tract comes that way. You use a tepid solution. You will hold the irrigating set no more than 18 inches above the level of the rectum. You will insert the tube no more than 4 inches into the rectum. And enemas are contraindicated if the patient has abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, or they suspect an appendicitis. Again, they're contraindicated because we don't want to end up with peritonitis due to a ruptured um, appendix. Let's talk now about catheterization. We'll talk about how to do a catheterization for a woman. You will start with the patient in the dorsal recumbent or SIMS position. You will drape her using sterile technique. You will apply sterile gloves using, again, the correct method to put them on. You will lubricate the catheter that comes with the set and place it in the sterile tray. You will separate the labia with your thumb and forefinger. Now, once you have that separated, you must keep your hand in place. You will wipe the meatus from the front toward the, rectum, toward the rectum with one swab, and you will do this again on each side using one swab each time, and once it has been wiped, you will place that swab outside your sterile field because you don't want to contaminate your field. With a woman, you will insert the catheter two to three inches into the urethra. Once you see urine flowing, you will insert it an additional inch. You will then inflate the balloon. You will gently tug on it, and I mean gently. You want to make sure that it stays in place, and you should be able to pull against a little bit of pressure. That tells you that it is in the bladder. Then you will tape the drainage tubing to the thigh. So that's how you would effectively and safely do a catheterization for a woman. Let's talk about how you would do a catheterization for a man. If a man is uncircumcised, you would retract the foreskin. Now, it's very important that you remember when you are finished with the catheterization to replace the foreskin. Otherwise, gangrene of the head of the penis can occur. So again, you retract the foreskin initially, replace it when you're done. You will clean the glands and the meatus with swabs in a circular motion. Again, you will do this three times using three different swabs starting at the center and going out. And your used swabs will go off your sterile field. You will hold the penis perpendicular to the body and you will insert the catheter six to seven inches. Once the catheter is in and you get urine, again, if the, the client is uncircumcised, you at that point in time will replace the foreskin. You will gently inflate the balloon. You will gently apply traction because, again, you need to make sure it stays in place. And then you will tape the drainage tubing to the thigh. Now, there's a couple things you need to remember about a catheter drainage system, and let's talk about those now. First of all, you should not disconnect the catheter from the drainage system. This should remain a closed system. It's a sterile system. Catheters are put in using sterile technique, and they are maintained using sterile technique. If you need to obtain samples, you will obtain them from the drainage port. 
And to do that, you will clamp the catheter below the port. You will wait a few minutes, and then catheter will come into the port area. You will then aspirate it using a syringe. Then you will unclamp it and allow the rest of the urine to drain as normal. A couple of other things. You do not elevate the drainage bag above the level of insertion. Remember, fluids love to run downhill. You keep the catheter bag low so the urine goes from the patient into the bag rather than from the bag back into the patient. If you're doing a straight catheterization or a catheterization for retention, it's imperative that you not remove any more than 700 cc's at any one time. What happens if you do that, there are fluid shifts in the body and it also could cause um, problems with the sphincter control and the, the muscular innervation of the bladder. And if a patient has had a catheter for a period of time, it's imperative that the catheter is clamped intermittently prior to removal. Otherwise, many times you take the catheter out, the patient has retention or incontinence, you end up putting the catheter back. But if you clamp it for a period of time, what you do is you get the bladder used to being full again and empty. Full again and empty. Because we'll clamp it two hours, it'll get full. We'll unclamp it, it will empty. It also helps the sphincter get used to working again. Now let's talk just briefly about a catheter irrigation. They are not done like they used to be. Um, many years ago, I would irrigate everyone's catheter on the floor. They soon learned that if you didn't come in with a urinary tract infection, we made sure you got one while you were with us. So again, now they know better. They know to keep the catheter system as a closed drainage system. But if an irrigation is necessary because the catheter has become occluded, you will use sterile technique. You will cleanse around the catheter. You will disconnect the tubing. You will gently instill 30 to 60 cc's of solution, and you will allow the fluid to return by gravity. If the fluid does not return, you will gently depress a bulb syringe and aspirate the fluid out. You will then, again, cleanse the end of the catheter tubing and reconnect the system. Again, this isn't done very frequently, but if the catheter becomes occluded, you need to get it working again, and that would be a good reason to break into the closed sterile system. This concludes our discussion of Physiological Integrity 3, Reduction of Risk Potential. I wish you good luck on your NCLEX exam. Thank you.